My name is Azam Ghani, and I'm the director of uh, IIPLA. So I welcome you to the EPLA 2023 Dubai, the premier event for all things in intellectual property. I'm thrilled to be standing here today as the director of this fantastic event. And I'm honored to be in the company of so many experts and thought leaders in the field. Before we begin, I want to set the tone for the day by sharing a couple of jokes that highlight the importance of intellectual property. Number one, why did the inventor call his patent office on a Sunday? Any thoughts on it? Because he had an idea and couldn't wait for the office hours. <laughs> the second one, uh, why did the trademark lawyer go to the beach? Of course, to catch some branding. <laughs> all right. Now, all in seriousness, as we all know, intellectual property is a vital aspect of innovation and creativity. It is what allows creators and inventors to protect their ideas and creations and ensures that we are properly compensated, they are properly compensated for their hard work. This even serves as an opportunity for all of us to come together and learn more about the latest developments in intellectual property law and policy. And to discuss the most pressing issues facing the industry today, from patent law and trademark law to copyright and trade secrets. We have exciting lineup of speakers, workshops, and panel discussions that will provide valuable insights and perspectives on a wide range of topics. Now, I want to thank all of our sponsors, speakers, and attendees for making this event possible. I encourage you all to make the most out of this opportunity to network, learn, and exchange ideas. So without further ado, let's get started on a day of learning, sharing, and fun. Let's make this day to remember. So today's first session is IP licensing from protecting IP to promoting partnerships. So the moderator for this session is Priya Rao, founder, Priya Rao and Associates India. Our first panelist is Begum Erturk, legal manager, Sabanchi Inc., Turkey. And Margarita Divina, partner, Meling, Voskin and Partners, Russia. <laughs> Lucius Kolbunik, lecturer in intellectual property law at Elston University, UK. <laughs> and Mohammad Farooq Irfan Khan, off council, United Trademark and Patent Services. <laughs> and the last we have, Mohammad. F. Al Hajeri, founder and president, Muhammad F. Al Hajeri for intellectual property. So maybe he's not here today. All right, so now I hand over the session to Priya Rao uh, to take this session forward from here. Good morning, everybody. I'm so delighted to be here and, uh, and being the first one, uh, uh, you know, moderating the first session, I think I'm super ex excited. And I have great, great panelists here speaking. So. Um, uh, I will first start with uh, Begum, uh, and she is making a presentation uh, on uh, intellectual property uh, protection uh, of uh, IP uh, in. Um, yes, and I welcome her first, and then and then we'll move forward with the other panelists. Good morning to everyone. Um, this is my first time in Dubai and al also my first time in this conference, IIPLA. So I am also super excited uh, and very happy to meet you here in person. Uh, I am legal uh, manager of Sabanju Group. Uh, I will be trying to explain you here in uh, 15 minutes very briefly uh, how uh, as Sabanju Group uh, we are protecting our trademarks and domain names under Turkish law and uh, international law. Uh, first of all, I would like to uh, present uh, my uh, group of companies because uh, I, I just want to give uh, you an idea overall uh, how 
Sabancı groups uh, perform and where they perform because uh, it's very important for uh, trademarks. Uh, so Sabancı Holding is uh, Turkey's, Turkey's uh, leading in conglomerate is a holding company engaged in a wide variety of business activities through um, its subsidiaries and affiliates, mainly in banking, technology, retail sector, and so on. Uh, Sabancı is domiciled in the Republic of Turkey with its headquarter in Istanbul, so I am working in Istanbul. Uh, Sabancı Group companies are operating uh, in uh, 14 countries and supplying their products to regions throughout uh, Europe, Middle East, Asia, North Africa, and South Africa, South America, sorry. Sabancı Holdings multinational business partners include, include prominent global companies such as uh, Bridgestone. So, uh, pro why we are uh, today talking about the protection of trademark and domain names? Because IP is the lifeblood of companies which fuels innovation, growth, and differentiation. So, protecting IP, IP rights allows companies to earn recognition and prevent authorized use of their work and the acquisition of benefits from them. Uh, it also provides guarantees to users and consumers regarding the quality and safety of the goods and services of the company. But actually, poor IP protection affects companies and also countries' competitiveness in the global economy. So, however, IP law still remains among the hidden or less visible cost of an attack. So, how uh, Turkey, um, <coughs> Turkish law uh, is designed? Actually, Turkey, uh, as many countries, is one of the members of MADID protocol. So, we are uh, taking advantage of this protocol and we are following its developments. Uh, so um, under word, WIPO word uh, IP indicators, actually, Turkey um, is the sixth, uh, on the six, sixth uh, rank uh, regarding the designs, and 10th ranked uh, on marks, and 23rd ranked uh, for patents. Uh, and Turkish intellectual property law actually uh, is adopted um, from, and from European uh, regulations, actually it's very similar to French law, uh, French law's IP, uh, IP systems. And also IP rights in Turkey are generally harmonized with European implementation and taking into consideration uh, the European developments and their jurisdictions and also so on, the, the decisions as well. Uh, so Turkish intellectual property law covers industrial property law law on intellectual and artistic works. Um, but of course, for domain name, uh, for, at the moment, there is no regulation. Uh, but actually, uh, in order to protect, of course, uh, domain names, if the domain names are uh, used as uh, trademarks, uh, we are going to WIPO and uh, settle, uh, settle the case. So why um, how, what is the trademark? We, know to, uh, we really need, need to know about it. A trademark actually is a symbol uh, for customers to use uh, to pick company uh, goods and services actually. So um, trademark has a strong influence purchasing uh, behavior as consumers make more careful decision. If, the, if you, um, your uh, companies or your goods, uh, they, they, don't, they don't have trademark, what happens actually? Uh, the customers, they don't recognize uh, which goods and services they need to pick up because actually trademark is based on, um, purchasing actually is based on confident, uh, confidence and also trust. So uh, trademark actually uh, ensure this trust um, in front of the customer eyes. So for example, customers, if they see Akbank uh, is, a, uh, one of, is a bank of the, our, um, is the bank of the, our group. Uh, so they, the customers, when they see Akbank, um, they can recognize uh, its services, is the, the quality of the services. Otherwise, um, they will not uh, really uh, able to uh, differentiate between banks. Uh, and domain names is actually um, actually uh, a website, uh, so it's quite similar to domain names because most of companies they use their trademarks uh, by creating their domain names. So how to protect actually uh, pro uh, the, our trademarks and domain names? Uh, we actually create um, a, a good IPR governance uh, in order to follow up our uh, trademarks and domain names all over the world. And actually we need to follow all these steps 
in order to protect our trademarks and domain names, first of all, we really need to build an IP, uh, IPR governance in our company. Uh, and then uh, we need to create a strong mark and register it uh, be, uh, before the relevant authority and follow up for uh, their renewals. And um, if you make your trademarks uh, well-known marks, it also uh, has more um, has a more power um, before another uh, trademarks actually. So um, uh, um, whatever the classes um, of the other trademarks, your well-known uh, trademarks will be protected more um, among these uh, other trademarks, of course. And also, uh, you need to uh, uh, you need to prepare your contracts very well in order to protect your trademarks. Uh, otherwise you can lose your uh, rights and uh, the third parties can abuse uh, abuse the use of the, abuse the your trademarks uh, under the license agreements uh, so you need to for example limit the um, uh, limit the time limit the geography uh, for your uh, licenses in order to protect your trademark and of course um, in the end you need to take legal actions um, against uh, misuse and uh, unlawful, unlawful use. Uh, then, um, if I uh, need to a little bit deep time on the IPR governance, how we work, uh, we prepare actually compliance documents and also uh, we create uh, systems. So, for, uh, in terms of compliance documents, we prepare, of course, first of all, uh, policy uh, pro procedures, guidelines regarding trademark trademarks and domain names and then of course you need to um, after you prepare your compliance documents you need to uh, make your employees and you make your third parties uh, and also affiliates uh, everybody in your ecosystems inform uh, about your procedures and guidelines for them to, um, to to know how they need to and must protect your trademarks and domain names of course uh, you need to uh, create your IP strategy, trademark strategy. So you need to be uh, aligned with CEO, CFO, and other general counsels you have. Um, and then uh, you need to create an IPR governance team. Um, you need to uh, really um, work very closely with your um, with other departments. And the, the, actually, for example, trademark departments and legal teams. They really need to work all together. Otherwise. Uh, for example, when, um, when the trademark uh, departments uh, works uh, and designs uh, about a mark, if they don't, um, don't ask uh, from the legal team support, uh, they just design the trademark and they don't search on the database. So uh, it's, these trademarks um, can, can infringe uh, the other, mar other third parties' trademarks. So they need to uh, cooperate with the legal team. And also, uh, of course, uh, educate, ed educate your team, uh, your IPR governance team, and also your employees, uh, because they need to know what, what does it mean trademark and domain names and how they must, um, they must protect it. Uh, when they um, perform their own, actually, uh, works in their own departments, uh, they need to uh, be aware of um, what are the details uh, they need to uh, take care of? It's about uh, trademark and domain names because after um, they skipped uh, the most important uh, steps uh, and um, without uh, taking our uh, consultations uh, le from the legal team, um, they just um, sign uh, some papers uh, which can infringe our trademark or dilute our trademark or they can design and register um, unlawful trademarks uh, or domain names. Um, so you need to create a registrable marks. Uh, I skipped it, this is because this is very uh, simple. So you need to uh, create um, very strong marks. Uh, that's why you need to also, uh, the, the mark departments uh, must work with uh, legal departments because they also sometimes they are not aware um, if uh, the designs, uh, if, uh, if their creation, trademark creations, they are uh, strong or not. Sometimes they just uh, create trademarks very, uh, very weak 
and then they want to register it, but uh, we, we must refuse and we must um, inform them why these trademarks mustn't be, um, uh, mustn't be registered because the weak trademarks cannot be well protected, and as well as the domain names. And uh, so the registration process is very important. You need to make uh, previous researches on the uh, relevant countries' um, database. So, uh, for example, Sabancı Group has more than uh, 820 trademarks registered in Turkey, and still we, are, uh, we have been uh, making some other registration in Brazil, in USA, in Israel, and in China. Uh, so it's very important to be present in countries. This is a strategy of also our group, uh, even though um, you are not um, established in these countries. So um, you know the protection of the years is 10 years for trademarks, but actually you must uh, really perform and uh, make marketing of your trademarks. Uh, otherwise, after five years, your trademarks uh, will be useless. Uh, will not be protected under the relevant uh, applicable uh, law, actually. But uh, for domain names, every year you need to renew uh, your uh, domain names in order to be protected. Um, so your trademarks must be uh, well known. Uh, in order to make your trademarks well known, you need to uh, follow the conditions of your own juris jurisdictions. Um, so you need to, uh, for example, make more marketing, and use more and more uh, your trademarks uh, all, around, all, around your, uh, all around the country uh, where your trademark is registered. So uh, actually, yeah, preparing contracts is very, very important. And put the, uh, uh, for example, um, penalty clause is very important. Uh, when, your, uh, when you, for example, your company uh, exits uh, from a GV, uh, you need to uh, prepare a naming rights and name change agreements. Otherwise, the company uh, from where you exit and um, the remaining shareholders can abuse your trademark. So it's very important to framework this uh, agreement. So, of course, taking legal actions very important and follow the follow up the uh, social media, internet, and everywhere. You need to make some research if your trademarks. Uh, are used by others or if the third parties just created uh, similar trademarks to, uh, to yours. Uh, so I just uh, can give you some uh, opinions and, um, some, and also open another subject. Uh, so IP regulatory uh, reform actually is very uh, well needed. Uh, the prevention, investigation and prosecution of cyber crime, uh, cyber crime shall be improved because uh, it's not possible to, um, uh, how can I say, uh, protect your domain names uh, all the time uh, because third party, uh, other persons, they just can uh, buy uh, domain names and you cannot follow it all the time and they can just uh, say, uh, send uh, similar domain names, actually they can purchase similar domain names to your domain names uh, and they can just send phishing mails to your third parties or uh, your clients, and they can uh, they can just make some frauds, and your third parties or your clients can uh, receive this mail and actually uh, send them uh, lots of uh, amount of money. Uh, so it's very important uh, to uh, act with uh, and actually um, create a very good regulation and also the cooperation between the countries. For example, when, um, when we act, when we take legal actions against uh, domain names uh, similar to our domain names, uh, which uh, caused a fraud uh, from Turkey, for example, uh, we, we need to um, spend lots of time in order to cooperate, for example, uh, US register. And it's very, uh, it's, it's really takes time. And the third party, for example, is based on, is based on Africa. So it takes too long to, to be able to find this, um, this person who uh, abused uh, our trademarks and as well our uh, customers. Uh, that's why the barriers in cross-border crime investigation by, by gathering e-evidence in an, in, in an interconnected society shall be uh, removed, actually. Thank you very much for your patience.
Thank you, Begum. This was very, very informative, very detailed. I think uh, we've uh, really learned a lot. So what uh, we could do is perhaps, uh, uh, you know, if you have any questions, make a note of it. Uh, we'll run the question on Q&A at the end. And um, uh, so we, I want to invite next uh, speaker, Margarita. Uh, Margarita. Uh, please come here, and uh, she's going to speak on IP uh, licensing. She has, uh, be, she specializes in intellectual property rights, and uh, she is also very popularly known as IP transaction guru, and uh, she will be speaking on IP licensing for Russia and CIS region. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. Uh, if you bear with me, I'll just try to put my presentation, if someone can help me with that. Thank you. Is your presentation? No. Okay. Did, did you share your presentation? moment it's almost there <laughs> Okay, oh, while we're downloading the presentation, ladies and gentlemen, good morning, nice to see you here. My name is Margarita Divina, I'm a partner of Melling, Vaitishkin and Partners based in Moscow. Uh, you may not know the brand, but we were, uh, until recently, a part of Becky McKenzie Network based in Moscow. Uh, right now we're rebranded uh, and uh, continue to bring our 30 years of experience in the uh, region. Thank you very much. Uh, so, uh, the topic of my speech today, uh, it would be uh, thank you, concentrated on IP licensing, but I would like to speak more about a very important point which was very kindly mentioned by our chairman, meaning money. So, uh, our chairman said about the compensation as one of the most important things for IP protection and licensing. In fact, IP licensing owns uh, actually, uh, the owner of IP really would like to license its IP because this is the only way how to actually get the money out of the asset. Uh, because uh, when we speak about uh, general IP protection, and thank you very much for the previous speaker who covered very nicely the way how to protect the brands and the main names, uh, owner actually spends money on research and development, on developing the brands, on developing the technologies, and all those, uh, all those stuff. Uh, basically, that's all the money spent. When someone infringes IP, again, you need to go to litigation, litigate in courts, uh, to hire very expensive lawyers, and this is again the money spent. Uh, on the other hand, uh, the licensing of IP and other types of IP transactions uh, is the only way to get money out of your asset. And we will speak about that right now in the next 15 minutes or so. So, uh, it's really important to ensure that you have something to license. And uh, in order to do that, you need to protect your IP. Basically, IP protection would be one of the most important of starting point for our IP licensing and uh, while the previous speaker spoke about the general kind of uh, ways as to how to protect the IP I would like to concentrate on the another point uh, when you would like to license something and to receive money out of it you need to have the appropriate protection because uh, I would not cover any specific jurisdiction not Russia not CIS but generally because we're doing the business internationally uh, when you like to license something and to get money out of it, you need to have a valuable right which is protected under the particular law of that jurisdiction. Uh, when the client comes to us and says, oh, I would like to license technology. Well, what does that mean? Does it mean patents, which needs to be very specifically protected under specific patent in specific territory? 
or it would like to license some know-how, which is a secret technology which is not patented because it's proprietary and shall not be made public. Uh, and in that case, we need to ensure that that type of technology complies with know-how protection in that specific jurisdiction where the owner generated that knowledge and also where it, like, it would like to license that. Uh, if we speak about trademarks, because many trademark licensing deals are happening around the world each second, I would say, you need to ensure that the trademarks which you'd like to license are specifically protected not in the some jurisdictions, but in a very specific those jurisdictions where you, you have the, your partner to license your trademarks. And more so, and we see that very often, uh, the IP owners do not think about as to how to protect the trademark in order to license it properly. Uh, just to give you an example, for example, if you would like to um, establish uh, the chain of retail stores in some kind of country, and you're sell selling apparel, which is class 25 goods, as we all know. And for example, you would like to, to do that in that in specific jurisdiction uh, where you have the protection just in class 25. Whether you can license retail sales services in that jurisdiction if you don't have class 35 registration? Of course not. And if you do, then you may face some adverse uh, consequences which are primarily on the tax side, which I will cover a bit later on. So, my point here is that before you start licensing anything, you need to ensure so you know, first of all, where you license that, who are your partners, to, to whom you license that, whether you have an adequate protection to ensure that the license is of valid grounds, it has very valid base to, to license, and it is uh, specifically protected. Uh, in my example for um, trademarks, you need to ensure that the entire, um, all those goods and services which are relevant for your licensing transactions are specifically covered in that jurisdiction where you license that. And basically, the lack of protection uh, in um, that jurisdiction for that type of IP would lead uh, to the fact that you will not receive money. Or if you do, it may be unjustified enrichment, which is either an offense or it may be just uh, trigger some kind of tax consequences, which, of course, you would not be willing to, uh, to face. Okay, uh, IP licensing is not any longer just a standalone transaction where you just license IP and that's it. Uh, IP licensing and other type of transactions right now are very major part of basically each and every M&A deal. And if you do, if you sell companies, if you sell assets of the companies, if you do whatever investment you do, they would be IP associated. And uh, right now, everything is technology, everything is data, data is new oil, as we all know, trademarks are very important. So basically, if and, if and when any type of transaction is happening, IP lawyers are extremely important. That's why we are kind of very busy, because right now, Everything is about IP, because uh, each and every business has either technology, whatever that means, patents and know-how, or brands, or software, because software is the, uh, the blood of uh, nowadays business. Uh, unless you have adequate protection for all of them, you will not have absolutely uh, the, uh, the clear deal. And just to give you an example, um, of how important IP is for M&A deals. Uh, it was kind of some time ago, I'm not sure, it was, it's probably even not 10 years, time flies so fast. It probably was 15 or so, even longer. Uh, there was um, a transaction where the car manufacturer bought another car manufacturer with all the plants and very expensive and very well-known brand, which I will not mention right here, but you will may Google that in, um, uh, later on. Anyways, uh, there was a big transaction and there was a, a M&A corporate lawyers working on the transaction for many months. Uh, they were buying the company and the assets of the company, the production plant, uh, the supply chain, all the associated agreements. And when they were about to close the deal, they understood that the trademarks belong to the company which is outside of the scope of the transaction, which usually happens because we all know that IP owners are usually specif specific purpose vehicles standing somewhere out of the main corporate structures. In that sense, again, if you do not do the IP due diligence properly, if you're not 
diligent enough to understand how the license flows from the IP owner to the entire chain of the corporate structures, you will not get the way, uh, you will not get the outcome which, which you will to, willing to have out uh, of this transaction, and you will not get money. Again, back to my point. So money is key, and that brings us to the idea that the IP is key to receive money. Uh, so again, the diligence of IP assets in each and every type of IP transaction, be it a standalone licensing or M&A part, is very important to ensure that the appropriate uh, profits would be received in a way that you wish to. So, uh, again, if you do not have the IP transaction, IP protected properly, you will not get the outcome you wish. Uh, as I said, uh, IP licensing right now is not just a standalone transaction whereby you just need to, oh, by the way, we are IP lawyers, we know everything about IP, that's it, full stop. No, right now, nowadays, uh, it's much more complex and much more uh, comprehensive, if I may say that. In order to have a very successful IP licensing deal or general IP deal, not just licensing, maybe assignments, it may be pledge, it may be swap, whatever, um, Basically, if to do, have to, 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 to do that transaction successfully, you need to think about the tax outcome of that uh, transaction. Um, in the past, it was um, in, in some of the jurisdictions, IP licensing transactions were used as a way how to get the money out of the company, uh, out of the country. Uh, we all know that there are just two basically legal ways how to get money out of the country. It's either dividends or royalties. So if there are no dividends, let's get some money as a way of royalties. And there were a lot of IP licensing transactions uh, without any appropriate ground, without any protected IP, without any kind of legal cause. For example, if the licensee do not, does not need to use that IP in their business, and that actually uh, triggered a lot of tax consequences. And e between OECD countries, uh, there was an initiative which is called BEPS, Base Erosion and Profit Shifting Arrangement, which uh, it was some year it was adopted some years ago, which basically aimed at the way how to mitigate unjustified royalty payments and unjustified. Um, mitigation of taxable base. So basically, that means that uh, when you license your IP, you need to ensure that, first of all, there is appropriate cause. So the licensee actually needs to use that IP in their business, in their manufacturing, in their activity. Uh, IP needs to be protected in a correct way, as I said before. So it should be, if you license a chain of uh, retail stores, you need to license class 35 goods. Uh, sorry, class 35 services rather than um, class 25 goods. Because uh, when you buy sell products for that type of arrangement, you don't need any license because it's just a buy sell arrangement. If you actually perform the services under the license brand, the brand needs to be protected under the appropriate services. In that case, the royalties which are payable money which is payable under that arrangement would be justified economically and approved by documents. And this is the test for appropriate um, uh, tax treatment of the royalty payments. So uh, to, to summarize that part, it's essentially important to ensure that we have appropriate licensee who uses that IP in appropriate business environment. IP is the correct one, meaning that actually used in the licensed services. And um, the entire scheme is not used as a tax evasion scheme. Apart from that general statement, there are a lot of other tax issues for the IP licensing. Uh, we all know that uh, royalties uh, are something which decrease the taxable base of the uh, payee, of the licensee. And in that sense, of course, it is under scrutiny of all the tax authorities around the world just to ensure that uh, it's not the tax evasion scheme. Uh, and we are, again need to ensure that all done properly. Apart from tax, there are also the uh, customs, uh, there may be also customs uh, issues with the IP licensing. Because if you are licensing IP and in that transaction some goods would 
pass or would cross the border of any jurisdiction, it may be the case that the customs authorities of that jurisdiction would like to include the royalties payable under the license agreement to the import duty of the imported goods, to the import tax of the imported products. Uh, to the extent that the, these royalties would relate to the imported products. Again, to that sense, to address that issue, we also need to ensure that the uh, license scope is specific enough, is expressed enough not to cover uh, the imported products. For example, if you license some manufacturer in a particular jurisdiction, be sure that once you define the base for the royalty, it shall not include the imported products as the base for calculation of royalty. Because otherwise, uh, the customs authorities of that particular jurisdiction may believe that the royalties uh, relate to imported products just because the uh, royalty rate includes imported products. And uh, the last but not the least, uh, in my 15 or so minutes presentation, I would like to mention that each and every IP is the result of created activity, creative activity of a human being. And uh, to achieve that result, uh, there is a person, there's, there's a natural person, and he or she usually works somewhere. And uh, once we would like to have a very successful licensing arrangement, we need to ensure that the IP owner who is licensing, for example, us, some IP, really has the ground, the rights, to that type of IP which it licenses. Uh, meaning that he, uh, the IP owner obtained, duly obtained all those rights from that natural persons who created that IP. And usually, this is the first kind of level of our research would be to study whether there is an employment relationship between the natural person who is the author of the IP and the IP owner. And uh, devil is in details, as always, uh, because uh, some jurisdictions would really require that there is appropriate employment documentation in place, meaning that employment agreement, which also covers the um, scope of work of particular employee, uh, because, for example, if you are a general director or CEO of a particular company and your job description does not cover any kind of creative activity, which means there is a question whether if you create something, if you, in your capacity of CEO, create something, whether that belongs to the company. And if not, probably some assignment agreements would be necessary to ensure that if we, as licensee, would like to receive clear title without any kind of encumbrances or any kind of other problems, if I may say like, like that. So that title needs to be cleared. And um, uh, again, if we speak about assignment agreements, that needs to be uh, clarified under the particular laws of that jurisdiction where that creative activity was made. And to summarize my very short presentation, it's impossible to cover everything in these 15 minutes, but just to give you a flavor that IP license is a very, very great tool to receive money. Second, you need to ensure that IP protection is in place. There is a valid cause for IP license. Fourth, there is appropriate licensee to whom you license or if you're a licensee, appropriate licensor from whom you receive that type of IP, uh, you need to do uh, the diligence uh, very clearly to understand what is licensed and under which conditions, and all other tax, customs, and employment considerations are being considered. In that case, you will get money. Thank you for your attention. Thank you, Margarita. I think it was uh, an amazing, very detailed, very informative um, presentation. Uh, you've co covered, of course, 15 minutes is not sufficient, I understand, but you have really covered the entire spectrum. Uh, you know, you've actually, you know, spoken about all the points, relevant points. 
Uh, also, I was thinking it from also from India perspective. Um, you know, mostly it's is the the law even in India is almost similar, and uh, just perhaps one uh, distinction in India is uh, that uh, we don't need a registration. Not everything which is registered can be licensed. Even an unregistered IP can also be licensed. So that's one distinction that I saw from your presentation vis-a-vis the country I come from, that's India. Uh, it, it depends on the type of IP which you license. If you license copyright, that does, that does not require registration. So uh, it, trademarks and patents really need to be registered, but uh, some copyrighted items and know-how are not subject to registration, but they still may be licensed. That's fantastic. Thank you so much. Now, moving on from general IP licensing, uh, I'm, I will invite uh, Lucius. He's a lecturer in intellectual property law at Aston University, UK. Uh, and he's going to make a specific uh, presentation on partnership in copyright licensing in Europe. So we are going now very specific to copyright licensing. Um, and somebody has Right. Good morning, everyone, and I'm really grateful for being invited here. Uh, thanks to the organizers, and thanks to everyone for, for showing up. This is my first time in, in IIPLA. All right, so thanks again. Uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, thanks again for being, being invited here. It's my great pleasure to be for the first time in, in IIPLA, and also for the first time, first time in Dubai. So. Looking forward to that, to that very much. Uh, my background is perhaps a little bit different than than, than to most of you. So I am I'm mostly coming from an academic background. So I am a researcher in intellectual property law, um, mostly mostly in copyright. Uh, I have worked and also currently working with so-called collective management organizations in copyright, which are licensing entities uh, in some jurisdictions, for instance, in the U.S., you might know, know them as PROs, so performing rights organizations. I will be referring to them as CMOs in this one, but um, but this term is, is quite quite interchangeable. So I'm going to talk here about forming partnerships in in licensing, um, in licensing of copyright. Why are they important? Uh, why have they been kind of proliferating in, in Europe lately, and also what are, what are potential, potential pitfalls. So uh, as in other, I believe, in other IP rights, also in copyright, we do need a, a lot of cooperation uh, in order to, to provide, I would say, uh, good quality licenses, quick licensing, and also good service for, uh, for licensees. Um, also, I would like to apologize that I actually don't don't have any business cards on me. I forgot them. I forgot them in England. So sorry for that. Uh, please feel free to to reach out on on LinkedIn under this name. I'm happy to connect. Also, as you will see, my my uh, slides are quite information dense. So I will just quickly breeze through some of them. But I'm I'm willing to willing to share them with with everyone uh, after the conference. Um, so. Uh, as I said, I'm, I'm a lecturer and academic. Currently, I'm working on a, on a book which will be which will be out, hopefully still still this year, and 
studies on innovative models for online music licensing. Okay, so now, what are these innovative models and why do we need them? Well, essentially, the, the main premise here is that the problem is not so much of a legal problem rather than technology problem. So even the, even the biggest CMOs, so collective management organizations in, in Europe, so the biggest ones who traditionally come from, from three countries, United Kingdom, France, and Germany, they have all experienced uh, problems with so-called data processing. Okay, so we are referring here to the copyright metadata, which is essentially uh, copyright information coming from uh, streaming services or, or other uh, internet, internet services that are using copyright protected works, uh, in particular music. So they are coming into collective management organizations that need to uh, process them and uh, do a quick matching with, with right holders and also pay, pay royalties very quickly. So they have been struggling to do that, so to do it quickly. So sometimes it takes uh, months, even three to four months to allocate royalties and then collective management organizations have been also, um, also having these so-called black boxes where you know, royalties that were supposed to be distributed simply simply disappeared. So we needed some kind of cooperation or uh, somehow sharing these, these databases and make them, make them more, more efficient in order to provide more efficient licenses. So now, now you may ask, why do we need these licenses? So firstly, obviously we have, uh, we have music streaming services such as Spotify, which are really, um, which are really big and prolific but also uh, we have a recent piece of legislation in the EU which is called the Copyright Digital Single Market Directive. So that comes from, that comes from 2019 and is currently being implemented in, in member states which says that, that also so-called uh, internet platforms uh, which legislation called online content sharing services, they will also have to get licenses. Okay, so I don't want, don't want to get de into details here, um, but just for you to know that also services such as, such as YouTube and other user-generated content services will need licenses, and they will most probably need them from, from these uh, innovative entities. Uh, so the creation of these licenses is actually coming from two different, uh, two different strands. So one are so-called market driven and the other ones are driven by legislation. I'll actually start with the, with the second ones. So the, although they, they do overlap to, to some extent. So uh, next to the mentioned DSM directive, we also have the so-called collective right, right management directive, uh, which essentially means that collective management of copyright has not been harmonized in Europe until 2014, or I shall say 2017, when this was really, really implemented in all, in all EU countries. And the idea was that collective management organizations would be operated under the same standards, and under the same principles. So especially when it comes to oversight, when it comes to distribution of royalties, when it comes to access to information, etc. So this was one main uh, kind of a strand, main, main part that, um, that the Collective Rights Management Directive did. So to harmonize regulation of collective management organizations, but then also it tried to facilitate multi-territorial licensing. And it only focused, focused on music, uh, perhaps because music is the, I would say the most um, royalty rich area and also it's been the most, um, the most developed in terms of, of licensing and, and revenue distribution. So, so it also tried to facilitate uh, music licensing and creations of, of partnerships in, in licensing. Okay, so this is where I'm going to skip some slides. Uh, again, I'm going to share this just to say that there have been issues with, with revenue distribution on the, on the European level so uh, 
So this is what the, what the directive wants to wants to prevent. So there would be there would be unified oversight on on distribution. Um, then another important part is that the directive says that well, if you're from one country in the EU, you don't have to have your rights licensed by the collective management organization in your country, but you are free to move them somewhere else. Okay, so somewhere else means to another collective management organization, but also to some other licensing entity. And also obviously you are allowed to do it to do it yourself. So you don't need collective management organization as an intermediary. Now this freedom of choice is actually quite quite big. So you as a right holder can define what kind of rights do you want to license? What kind of territories do you do you want to use them for? So, for instance, you can go to, you can choose a collective management organization in Germany, and you can say that you want the German organization to, uh, to license for for whole Europe, for your rights. Also, you are able to determine types of uses. So you can say that uh, internet uses should be licensed by one society, and then other types of uses should be should be licensed by by another society. So this has this actually has created some kind of problems because this choice is supposed to be made based based on the so-called categories of rights. So we cannot say that right I want let's say some of my songs to be licensed by one society, other songs by other society. You actually have to do the whole repertoire. But what you can do is that you can say that I want my online rights licensed by one society. However, you can even divide those online rights into communication to the public right and reproduction right, which actually could be licensed separately. But from a licensee's perspective, this doesn't give you only one category of this right. Actually, it doesn't give you a right to exploit those works. So this actually has been has been quite a drawback of this really wide uh, freedom to say that you can choose only particular rights or, or categories of rights, even though they would not lead to to a usable license for for the licensee. Okay, so this um, this is perhaps something something that that has to be that has to be fixed, and some countries how defined or should I say some collective management organizations how actually defined these categories of rights in order to give a usable license. So for instance, an example comes from France or Germany where they, where they tie um, communication to the public right and reproduction right into one category, which means that you can only withdraw both of them and you can only uh, mandate another society with the licensing of, of the both of them. But again, categories of rights are unfortunately not harmonized in Europe. So other collecting societies or other countries might interpret it differently. So usually categories of rights would be based on definition by collective management organizations. Perhaps it would be better if there was some, there was some harmonization in this area allowing, uh, for instance, um, interpreting what they mean. And this would also, also help with the, with the seamless movement and thus increase the quality of, of licensees. So one of the ways that, that the European legislator tried to, to facilitate licensing is that it noticed that, right, we do have some big music streaming services, but we do not have many startups. So how do we, how do we encourage that? So they came with this idea of um, of giving some kind of a preferential license to to startups, which means that in case it's a new type of service, active less than three years uh, in Europe, then licensors do not have to use standard tariffs, but can they, they can use lower tariffs. However, a problem with this is that research has shown that this is actually not used in practice at all, um, and that is because it's again up to license source uh, to determine. What is a new service? Does it have to be a completely new type, or is it perhaps that it requires 
another layer of, of functionality on the top. So this hasn't really been, been clarified and therefore therefore not really, not really used. Uh, one good example actually comes from a German collective management organization, GEMA, that introduced, however, only for, only for licensing in, in Germany, which says that all new services can, can use this benefit. So it doesn't have to be a new type. Okay, so it doesn't have to be, let's say, too innovative. It's enough that they haven't been in market for, uh, for more, than, more than three years. Okay, so this is, again, one of the examples where, uh, where the incentive was coming from, from the legislator, but it hasn't shown. Uh, it has shown some, some potential, but it unfortunately hasn't shown a lot of, lot of results. So let me now, now move to, because I only have around, around two, three minutes, so I don't want to, want to keep you too long. Uh, let me now move to what kind of licensing entities do we actually have, have in Europe currently. So we have CMOs, we have hubs of those CMOs, and then we also have independent management entities. I'll explain just in a, in a while what they, what they mean. Uh, so this is what the legislator in the Quality Rights Management Directive envisaged, that we would have, we would have these, these two licensors compete for, for right holders' rights, but essentially we also have also the so-called option three licensing entities, which are essentially licensing entities of large publishers and the main difference between option three and the rest is that they do represent large repertoire, but technically it is just one right holder. So that's why they, they would not fit within the definition of collective management or individual or independent management entities because they only represent one, one right holder. So they are not subject to controls in, this, in the same level as, as other entities are. Okay, so when it comes to when it comes to those independent management organizations, so the main difference between them and CMOs is that they do not have to be uh, owned or controlled by right holders. They are organized on a on a for profit basis. So this is the main difference. CMOs are essentially not for profit in Europe, especially on the continent, and and they are always controlled by by right holders. So not in the case of of IMEs, uh, however, oversight and registration has been has to be controlled on a national level, uh, which again uh, you can see that national legislators they actually put a lot of other obstacles for for IME, so they actually put them on the same level uh, level as CMOs. Uh, then for IMEs is also very difficult to be included in some larger structures where CMOs participate. So for instance in uh, in CSAC, and they cannot not thus form uh, they have no participation or uh, little participation in in uh, creating standards okay so this is this is the main the main difference that again we do have these these new entities but they haven't been proliferating and that is particularly because it's still very much in the hands of CMOs as to how do you define rights? So what can you, what can you withdraw from CMOs and uh, what can you mandate the independent management entities with? And also what's the level of, of oversight? Okay, so again, I'm going to skip few, but I want to show you perhaps this one, a very complicated picture on, of how does online music licensing in Europe currently look. So on the, on the left-hand side, you have, the, you have the CMO hubs which again, if you, if you remember my, my first slide, I was talking about cooperation. So this is cooperation among uh, existing large uh, collective management organizations that decide to pull their resources together, especially when it comes to, comes to IT infrastructure, but also their repertoires. So for instance, one of the big ones is the so-called ICE, ICE acronym standing for International Copyright Enterprise. Uh, then there is Armonia and, and Mint. So essentially have these three that, that give license to, to very large repertoires. However, when it comes to major publishers, only to communication to the public, right? Then you have on top uh, CMOs, so traditional national CMOs, which, just, just a second, which um, 
give licenses on, on national level. Then at the bottom you have you have IMEs, and then you have also the the options three options three publishers on the right hand side on the top, which give licenses only to to major repertoire. Um, that will be all for now. Uh, thanks so much for for being patient, and again, I'm free to to share this this presentation. So feel free to reach out anytime. Thank you. Thank you. You know, I do, I was actually thinking from India perspective. Uh, in India, you know, the, the copyright uh, society is um, mandatorily, it has to be registered under the copyright law in India. And it's a very aggressive uh, body in India. So, so how um, do, do you have, and, and they use both the civil procedure as well as the criminal procedure to enforce um, their rights. Now, in, in, in your, um, for you, I mean, how do you look at enforcement? Is it possible um, for Europe to enforce it because it's online? How do you kind of enforce it um, uh, through? Perhaps now, okay. So, uh, thanks for the question. I would definitely like to learn, learn more about India. I um, think it's a little bit more difficult because currently the, um, so international enforcement has been based on cooperation among uh, collective management organizations. So if, if the Indian one does have um, agreements with, with, with European ones, that would be that would be a little bit little bit easier, but I understand that on, that on the worldwide basis, um, things are the movement is quite positive, I would say. So you can see that more agreements are being being made. Uh, more countries are just more um, conscious of um, uh, of copyright. Of I wouldn't say copyright infringement, but of the need to license and to provide licenses that are that are favorable to to both users and, and and copyright holders and in the end i'm afraid that this this actually does come to um in the end this is this is a data management problem so if collecting societies are able to manage and process their data well that also means that they can be more more transparent in their international agreements Thank you so much. Thank you. So now uh, we have our last panelist, and um, it's an honor to invite uh, Justice retired Mr. Farooq Irfan Khan. Uh, he's uh, from. He's the chairman of uh, United Trademark and Patent Services. Um, he's going to be speaking on uh, licensing in Middle East. Thank you, Priya. Um, I must say that uh, we need to greet you, and I will greet you as we greet people in the Middle East, say, Assalamu Alaikum, uh, which means peace be unto you and peace be upon you. So this very much sets the tone of doing business in the Middle East. Uh, Middle East is open for business, in particular, United Arab Emirates, Saudi, Qatar, Bahrain. We are open for business over here. And there is no better way of doing business in the Middle East than by licensing your intellectual property rights, franchising your products and your trademarks and your know-how, licensing your technology, and, of course, licensing your, your copyrights. Um, I came to United Arab Emirates in 1988. Many of you in the room were not born even then, you see. <laughs> so, and there was no intellectual property law here. It was a small Arab state uh, with a small airport, but I think a very large heart of the rulers and a very, very intelligent brain of the people who were uh, trying to create something out of nothing. And over the years, I saw that you know there was an openness, there was an um, there was a culture of understanding, there was a culture of knowing. I worked with many governmental officials. I worked with many of the top government authorities. And as the period, as the time passed by, 
They are very quick learners, and the, the intellectual property laws were placed. And um, today, this is one of the most busiest places in terms of licensing, in terms of protection of intellectual property, in terms of the regime for intellectual property. So it is a fit place for intellectual property owners to do their business. Uh, I had prepared a, a written uh, you know, presentation, but I'm not doing that because Begum, Davina, and Lucius have very comprehensively covered various aspects of, uh, of uh, licensing and of in protection of intellectual property. But just to have a recap, we all know that licensing in IP can include trademarks, patents, copyrights, trade secrets, uh, know-how, you know, your... Um, uh, your, you know, your ability to manage, uh, you know, certain things. Also now data is going into the domain of licensing. So there's a wide spectrum. And uh, here we see that, I will give you some uh, examples that uh, trademark licensing, for example, a very big brand, Toys R Us, you know, all of us who have kids, Babies R Us, we have been to Toys R Us stores in the United States. Um, it was a very big company. You know, my kids grew up on Toys R Us stores, toys, and suddenly one day we realized that the company is going bankrupt. But it was going bankrupt in the United States and in Europe, but in the Middle East it was doing a thumping business because the licensee over here was a very strong, uh, you know, licensee, a very strong family business. You know, the, the, the Al Futayim group, which had really adopted the trademark and made it so popular and, and so successful that while the business in the United States faltered or elsewhere, it you know, was uh, doing very well in the, in the Middle East. So that gave hope to the trademark and it happens to be my client and uh, the trademark survived. It was ultimately bought by some uh, you know, venture capitalist and it has been revived, thanks only to the strength and the money and the flow of licensing fee and, and the franchising fee that was flowing for the Middle East, that the, the brand could make a turnaround and come back in the international market. So um, this is one example. Uh, other examples are that, you know, we are crea for, for patents. Now there is a lot of transfer of technology because in the UAE we have innovation hubs which have come into being in, in uh, Saudi Arabia. Uh, they are creating Naum City, which is a technology-based city. So, um, so there is a lot of scope for uh, you know, work, bringing your technology to this part. And then there is a kind of a hunger for knowledge. There is a kind of a hunger for, um, for, for, for innovation. There is a kind of a hunger to learn how you know, things are done in the rest of the world and making this part a, a hub where everybody can come and they can live here and they can enjoy. And licensing, I tell you, licensing is, at the, is the backbone of all this over here. So um, main features, what you should remember as we have an international audience over here is when you're coming to the Middle East, whom are you doing business with, you see? It's very important. Uh, if you are doing business, with um, a local family, which is one of the major families, then you have to do your due diligence. You have to see what other licenses they have, what is their track record, and how they have dealt with their other, other um, businesses in terms of franchising and licensing. Then you have to see what are the religious susceptibilities, how you know, the, the, a particular brand is going to be accepted in terms of the culture, in terms of the norm, in terms of the, the, the society that is prevalent. Um, so this is uh, something that you need to understand. Um, agriculture is a major focus over here. So technology is leading uh, you know, um, for, for to, uh, better agricultural uh, products are very much in demand. Drip uh, irrigation, it's a desert, we must remember that. All the green that you see, is the, is the hard work of last 30 years only. Prior to that, there were only, you know, oases in uh, maybe 20, 30 kilometers apart. But today when you fly into Dubai or into Abu Dhabi, 
there is a whole jungle of green uh, you know that uh, that you see which is which is commendable so drip irrigation and water conservation water purification this is a land ir and and this is an area devoid of water you must realize and so um, th this is a very big concern we, some say that oil is cheaper here than water is you see so but we can't drink oil unfortunately we have to drink water um, so uh, these are the things you must know what are the what are the general policies of the government you see well, governments would um, the, the domestic the, the governments in various emirates would would prefer to have certain technologies would prefer to have certain uh, you know areas of business come into uh, into this area and then, uh, you know, continue with the, with the growth pattern that is taking place. Um, also to understand uh, is that um, the system is not as sophisticated as in, in, in Europe and India or the subcontinent or because we have a hundred year plus system or in Europe. So it's, it's new, there are glitches, you know, there, are, uh, there is lack of understanding still although a lot of effort is made to come up um, to uh, you know to to come up and to be uh, you know almost at the same level as as international other other countries are so you have to be a little patient sometimes clients in europe and us say ah you know we can get this thing in in 20 days what's happening you know over here for example i can tell you with my own example there are certain countries which had you know, laws to protect plant varieties, you see, breeders' rights. And um, these countries uh, had the laws, but they had never f received any application uh, to, to protect those breeders' rights. So when uh, the companies wanted to license there, for example, strawberry is now grown in United Arab Emirates. So the, the company in California which licensed to the, to the breeders over here wouldn't understand why, you know, these applications would not... Uh, go through because nobody knew how to deal with them and there had to be a protocol which had to be set in so there there uh, in certain fields there is still breaking ground but you know the good th good news is that the authorities that the government is willing to learn willing to understand and willing to facilitate you see as long as it's a legitimate business it creates you know it creates value in the chain and it it is beneficial to the domestic economy. So um, one has to uh, be aware of uh, these factors. Then there is, in the law still, there is a general bias towards the domestic companies, you see. As international owners of IP rights, if you are uh, doing licensing, uh, you know, you must be aware that if you're dealing with a, with a local company uh, in the law, there is a general bias. It, it, is, it is changing, it's going to improve, but when dealing with those litigation matters, uh, you have to be, uh, you have to be um, uh, aware of these aspects. And um, I've been told that, uh, you know, <laughs> I have to, uh, two minutes left. Um, it's a very wide subject, actually, you see. Uh, you, you, you can go on and on and on, uh, with uh, on-life examples, so I thought that um, I would stay away from the text but give my experiences and the general information for the benefit of the audiences. So as a parting thought, you know, Azam said that uh, in the beginning that why, why, do, um, um, why do inventors, you know, uh, call the patent office on a Sunday because it's the idea. So in, the, in our subcontinent and Priya and, uh, you know, Kavita are here, they would say we were, we, we, subcontinent in the 18th and 19th century was very rich in, in, in literature. You see, it was before the British took over, we were the one third of the world's, uh, you know, economic, uh, whatever, you know, you call it, the, it was so rich the subcontinent was. And so poetry was one of the most popular means of expressing yourself, also in Iran, also in Turkey, also in Arabia. So there is one famous poet, Ghalib, and you know, some of you, it's very, very romantic poet. So he would write in his biography that, you know, the best, um, you know, verses came to me in the middle of the night. And it was, of course, there was no electricity in those days and they used to use baby candles. So he said, I would not be able to write them. 
So what I would do is, you know, uh, if you understand, our, you know, our national dress in the, in the subcontinent is like a trouser, which is, which is closed like a belt with a kamarband. We call it in English also, the British took the word kamarband. So it is like a string which is drawn through your trouser and, and you, you close the, the trouser with it. So he said, I would make a knot in my kamarband in the middle of the night and when I would untie, the whole verse will come back to me in the morning. So, so you know, there are ways of remembering things and inventors do remember things and they do write about things and so do the artists. So I would thank you very much and I must say that this is just the early morning. It's the first session. The, 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 the friends and the audience must really perk up. You know, you, you must be up and cheering rather than, you know, we must, uh, because there is a lot to do in the whole day. So thank you very much indeed. Thank you, Mr. Khan. I, th I, I second, uh, you know, the, your uh, experience and what you spoke out of your experience is, uh, is a great takeaway for all of us. And I just wanted to quickly ask you, Mr. Khan, is uh, um, how is uh, enforcement uh, in, in Middle East is like, for example, um, uh, you, is it uh, mandatory to register your license? Uh, and how effective, and what is the plus and minus for that? Uh, very good question. I must say, like all things, um, I, and I, I will speak about United Arab Emirates and Qatar, like all things which are on a first class level, uh, you know, uh, protection of IP rights is excellent over here. Regime has been made very simple. You know, you can go to a court of law, but the authority has been delegated to the economic department. It has been delegated to the customs authorities. So you can stop counterfeits, you know, in a rather inexpensive way by approaching these uh, authorities. And uh, it's a very quick fix system. Uh, you know, they, they take action. If you have the rights, you have the registrations. Of course, um, it's, uh, the registration of licenses is not mandatory but it's recommended. In the law, the benefits are that, you know, your, for example, your patent cannot be challenged for non-use or, you know, as a, uh, not considered as a monopoly. Your trademark can also, you know, be protected in terms of your, uh, uh, in terms of your, you know, non-use requirements. So we would recommend that you register your licenses in terms of your uh, technology and in terms of your patents and, and, and trademarks. Copyright is still a weak area. You see, like uh, Monsieur said that uh, the biggest revenue stream, and I know for sure that biggest revenue stream in the US and the, and the UK uh, is, is copyright. Here, you know, in the entertainment industry, in the restaurants, in, in, in a lot of hotels, you know, international music or music of, you know, a lot of well-known artists is played, but there is nobody to, to collect any uh, royalty on that. You know, people don't pay royalty for that. Similarly, and this actually causes, I work with a lot of local artists and give them support. Local artists are poor because of that. You know, they are great artists, they are great in music, they are great musicians, they are great, great singers, they are great playwrights, but their works are misused and abused. If there is a popular television series, it can be, you know, copied and nobody's there. I mean, the, the stream and the, the uh, what you call the regime is not there to protect that, you see. But overall, for trademarks, patents, which are commercial and general used, is a very good system for protection. Thank you so much. I will uh, now open the floor for more questions. Uh, please raise your hand and we'll pass the mic. Does anybody have a question? In Turkey, uh, when you were talking about the scope of trademark, uh, do you all allow for protection of color or sound or smell? Yeah, like in USA, right? Uh, no. <laughs> it's not really um, actually easy to protect colors. Actually, it's, um, in the US, you can uh, register uh, smells and color, but it's still not easy. And as well as in Europe, it's allowed, but still not easy. But in Turkey, um, yeah, the authority um, really cannot really... Uh, how can I say, grant the, for example, our color blue, 
dark blue to our Sabanja group. No, it's not really possible. Yeah. Thank you. Hi, I'm Anna. I work for AVM uh, uh, Advogados. Uh, our head office is in Angola, and we have also have office in Mozambique and Portugal. And like uh, the last uh, talk about it, Angola EP office has like 30 years, and everyone complains about the time they they take to grant the trademarks and patents. But everyone, especially in uh, Europe, forget that uh, Angola uh, EP office has 30 uh, years, but is in peace for just 20. And uh, I work in IP in Angola for 15 years. And in that time, a trademark took about 10 years to be granted. It would be granted with the renewal. Now they just take two years. I know that you understand you year two years it's a lot, but two years in comparison to fifteen, it's great. And we must always take in mind that in Africa, Middle East, and even in some European countries that, that are new, things does not work as in that country. We always take in mind that sometimes you don't have power, sometimes you don't have internet, even though we have two suppliers. We have taken in mind that sometimes it's impossible to go to the office because it's pouring and it's impossible to get there. I just want to say that I understand. And it's quite difficult to work like that. So thank you so much, panelists and the moderator. We'll now distribute the mementos as a token of, uh, you know, uh, memorization of our event. Yeah. Thank you so much, everyone. Uh, we'll now move to the short networking break, and we'll be back by 11 AM. Thank you so much. Thank you. With our session two, the fifth industrial revolution and intellectual property. Everyone, please come inside and have a seat. All right, the, the moderator for the session is David Carstens, partner, Carstens, Allen and Gourley, LLP USA. Good morning. We're going to go ahead and get started.
let everyone network out there if they'd like to. My name is David Karstens, and uh, here in a bit I'll, I'll introduce the rest of our panel. Uh, I know everyone has just had a chance to learn a lot of very concrete information about trademarks and licensing, copyright and licensing. And uh, uh, in stark contrast, our presentation will be about the future. It'll be about the fifth industrial revolution. And uh, that's kind of a vague concept, the fifth industrial revolution. Uh, I certainly grew up learning about what the first industrial revolution was. Uh, but we're going to go ahead and talk about how technology has progressed, how there have been certain milestones. And those milestones really define certain eras. Here, go ahead and relax, guys, and have a seat. And I just like to stand, so I'm used to standing. Um, our first panelist, Avinav uh, Banerjee. Hello, everyone. Good morning. I'm Avinav Banerjee. I'm from the IP analytics and intelligence team, Airbus. Uh, we're based out of Bangalore, India. And um, basically, um, you'll see me again in an afternoon session. So I think I'll probably give a bigger <laughs> introduction then. Yeah. But yeah, that's it. Uh, Hello, I'm, I'm Lucius. I'm a lecturer currently in, in IP law at Aston University, Birmingham. Well, I forgot to mention in the first panel, actually, that I'm, uh, that I'm also a fellow with, uh, with WIPO, working with uh, collective management organizations from a competition law perspective and also copyright perspective. I was just joking with Lucius that he already got one plaque, so now he'll get a second plaque. And his goal by the end of the uh, entire conference is to have at least six plaques. I mean, I will also have two, at least. <laughs> <laughs> Well, two, black, two plaques should be the, the maximum allowed, so. Um, you know, the, as I said before, this is all about where is technology going, how is it having an impact on society, and then likewise, how does that impact uh, the way law is structured to deal with those impacts on society? Now, most of you are probably familiar with the first Industrial Revolution. A lot of people talk about that as having been the invention of the steam engine, the ability to harness steam power. And you might remember a name, James Watt. James Watt, 1776, developed kind of a functional steam engine. And, you know, before that, it had just been a lot of human labor. You know, how strong were people's muscles? And when they realized that they could harness steam, of course, productivity, productivity went up. Now, we're going to spend a little time talking about the first, second, third, and fourth industrial revolutions. And, and we won't belabor it. This isn't going to be a, a history quiz, although the answer to the final question is C. Um, but we are going to talk about some of the issues that came up with each one of those industrial revolutions. Because I think what you'll see is that some of those same issues are attacking us in the fifth industrial revolution. Hey, just a quick show of hands. How many of you have talked about 5IR? before the fifth industrial revolution. It, it's not that well known of a, of a phrase, but just a show of hands, how many have heard of the fifth industrial revolution? A few, yeah, so about 20, 30% maybe. You know, and, and I'll be honest, I'm not sure I really was as aware of it or that I could draw the lines between the various uh, revolutions, but, but at least I knew that first one was James Watt and steam, steam power. So, uh, how about you guys? Did you familiar with the the various industrial revolutions? What led you to to be interested in this topic? I mean, I just heard of that uh, quite briefly, to be honest, about the fifth one. And also, if you just think about the speed we are we currently having industrial revolutions, right? So this is the second one in the 21st century already, yeah. and third one in the last 40 years. Right? So if you think about it, we had two until the 90s. And right. since then we already had, we already having the third one. So, so definitely the, the speed of these, uh, or the technology development and of industrial revolutions is, is very high. And I think that, um, that you know, IP just needs to catch up. Yeah, yeah, because I think this is gonna impact our lives, not, not our children's or our grandchildren's, but actually our lives. Yeah, and uh, as it is, you know, um, us as in, in uh, being part of the industry, I can say, um, a lot of us are right now um, facing challenges as it is to implement the fourth to its full potential, <laughs> you know? 
So, but then we are coming up with the enabling technologies and this kind of helps us, you know, see forward, look forward and build our, the advanced stages of our fourth industrial revolution, which forms the basis for the fifth. You know, a lot of the companies right now, knowingly or unknowingly, are imbibing the values of the fifth industrial revolution as part of what they do in their uh, digitalization programs in the fourth industrial revolution. So we're living in interesting times. We have a lot to talk about. Yeah, well, let, let's go back in history, back to uh, 1776 and James Watt harnessing steam engine. Now, we actually had a little debate about whether that was the first industrial revolution or whether we really should talk about Gutenberg and the, the removable type press, the ability to mass produce books. Uh, and in fact, one of the dichotomies here is, are we really talking about a revolution involving uh, increased speed of knowledge or increased speed of production? You know, is it about the ability to rapidly increase and magnify, force multiply human labor, or to increase the speed at which people are exposed to ideas? I would say it's a, sorry. It, it, it's a bit of both, uh, because as you can see with the as you can see with the printing press. So it was about availability of the printing press, but then essentially you know, access to information, data, knowledge that you that you essentially had uh, had from it. So um, yeah, I guess it's a bit of a bit of a both, and in the current speed of access to to knowledge these days, it's, it's really unprecedented, mm -hmm. right? So it's, it's really easy to share anything within seconds from, from around the world. So this is something that has to be, has to be, has to be accounted for. And this is what the, what the printing press has also, has also shown us that, that once you are able to, um, to share information quickly, then you perhaps need a new, I wouldn't say a new system, but perhaps just to rethink old paradigms. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I mean, if the printing press was the first information revolution, uh, probably we would then have radio, and then we had the internet, and now we are talking about things like the metaverse, right? So, uh, I mean, if you actually see how these things have uh, evolved over time is, with the printing press, it was information, but then that information found its way to different parts of the world where people acted on that information. Uh, right now, for the fifth industrial revolution, what we're gonna be facing is this kind of information is going to be used to train AI systems. How we um, decide to use this information, how we decide to train the AI systems to understand this information and act on it, that's, that, that particular interface is actually going to define what Fiverr means for us. Mm -hmm. Uh, I'd like to, uh, you know, uh, just so that we're all on the boat together, same boat, I'd like to think of the fifth industrial revolution as something what you might probably, a lot of you would have seen the cartoon series Jetsons, <laughs> and how man and machine work together, society, every day. Think of the fifth industrial revolution as that. Yeah, and there are different definitions, certainly for fifth industrial revolution. Uh, I'm going to stay on the first, though, for just a little bit longer because there's another issue I want to kind of tease out, which was, uh, how many of y'all have heard of the famous French physicist named Carnot, C-A-R-N-O-T? If you've ever taken classes on thermodynamics, you'll know about the Carnot cycle. And, uh, yeah, Carnot cycle is, you know, just this idea that, you know, heat transfers between a first heat reservoir and a second one. And, uh, and uh, the, the part that doesn't make it is translated into work. And the interesting thing about Carnot was he was uh, scared of Great Britain. He was scared of that Great Britain, because of James Watt and some subsequent inventors, had built a dominant lead in steam power. And so this is another one of those kind of interesting issues that comes about with technological revolution is that it provides a, a competitive advantage to certain nations. And steam power certainly gave a competitive advantage to the British. Uh, so much so that Carnot dedicated his short life to the study of thermodynamics, 
uh, to try to bring France back up at least to even with Great Britain. Now, um, that's just a little bit of interesting history about technology. Everyone should have for a later cocktail party so they can, they can talk about it. Um, I think, generally speaking, the second industrial revolution was when they started to use uh, electricity as opposed to steam power, and it was by and large marked with mass production of goods and assembly lines. Now, one of the interesting issues that comes about with that is you start to see a great divergence in wealth. There were those who were factory owners who became wealthy, and there were the poor who were slaves or wage slaves. And those who were in charge of the second industrial revolution you know, have foundations named after them and buildings named after them, or universities named after them. So um, again, a, a kind of a, a, a difficult issue, but one that society faces or faced, and of course has, has responded with new laws to try to minimize those inequalities. Uh, the third industrial revolution would generally be referred to as the digital revolution. This was kind of a shift from more mechanical uh, and analog machinery uh, to digital, you know, digital computers, digital record keeping. You know, uh, anybody here heard of Charles Babbage? Yeah, one of the very first uh, computers. Again, British. I don't know why they got ahead so far, but they sure did. <laughs> Uh, one of my hometown heroes is a guy named Jack Kilby, works for Texas Instruments. Also, one of the leaders of the digital revolution uh, was one of the inventors of the integrated circuit. Um, certainly made a huge difference in all of our lives uh, with the initial concept of integrated circuits. Um, and of course, that was just in 1958. So you see, we're already kind of up into the lifespan of some of us. Not me, but some of you. <laughs> So, you know, where we're at right now has kind of evolved even past that. You know, we're no longer really, you know, we're past that third revolution. Now we're up into the fourth industrial revolution. And, and I don't know, how would you guys characterize the fourth industrial revolution? More specifically, how has it affected society as a whole? So, um, the fourth industrial revolution basically is centered around cyber physical systems, which basically mean you automate more for machines to do. Not just mechanical automation, but also uh, intelligent decision-making uh, automation. However, um, uh, as of today, um, you know, um, the industry right now, especially manufacturing industries, what happens is we have different uh, value chains. You have the design and engineering, you have the manufacturing, and then you have the product service life, so entire product life cycle management goes on. And uh, these are all disparate systems, all right? Uh, they work in silos. And uh, to actually, the challenge is to come up with a collective intelligence to basically see end-to-end -end the whole big picture together and have AI systems which give you uh, actionable insights to improve processes, right? Uh, so basically, that's what the entire fourth industrial revolution is. Uh, you, you would have heard uh, things like the Internet of Things, uh, of course, AI, ML, of course, uh, things like um, you know blockchain. So these are all the building blocks of the fourth industrial revolution. And uh, right now, I can say um, everyone's working on it. I mean, everyone claims to be on it. Everyone are working on it. Uh, but, you know, the full potential of the uh, fourth industrial revolution is something that everyone is working on. And nobody's really achieved it. And I don't think it's going to be so simple because uh, what's going to happen is we are, it's going to be an organic transition from the fourth onto the fifth, you know. So as we build and uh, advance the fourth industrial revolution, we're suddenly going to, you know, find ourselves like, hey, we're already doing the fifth industrial revolution as it has been <laughs> defined over the past, say, uh, five years. So that's how it's going to go about. You know, I'll give a kind of an interesting example. Uh, a couple of weeks ago, I was on a long vacation uh, with my family, and, and we had recently uh, updated our house 
and uh, put in fancy thermostats and security systems, some other things. And I was in Europe, and yet from my cell phone, I could check the temperature in the house. There was this terrible cold freeze that had gone through, and I was worried about pipes breaking and silly things like that. I was able to check the security cameras all from my cell phone while I'm sitting in France. And, and I thought, well, you know, that's the sort of smart automation and interconnectivity that you, you just almost couldn't have had even 10 years prior. Uh, sometimes I, I think about the fourth generation or the fourth industrial revolution starting sometime around 93, and that's when I got my first fancy cell phone. Because at that point, uh, it, was, it was just a game changer. You know, you could, uh, while you're driving, you could call whoever you want to, pretty much anywhere you want to, to make a call. I guess that was a phone that looked like a suitcase, probably, right? Or something on, along those lines. Yeah. Um, just to connect to what, what you were saying is that the way I see it is it the, um, that with the increased numbers of uh, industrial revolutions, I would say also societal benefit is, is higher. Because as you said with the first one, um, that you only had perhaps one or two countries benefited from that, or just a very small number of people within that country. Then in the second one, you perhaps had a few industry tycoons and then some people who could use their products. Um, but then I would say that with the increased number of industrial revolutions we are, so the number of people who can benefit from it is, uh, is increasingly higher. So for instance, many of us use digital products or digital services. Um, I guess the number of people currently in the world is in billions that use digital services and I guess it is going to be even, even higher with, with artificial intelligence and automation that essentially all of us will be, will be subjected to. Yeah, Lucius, I, I think you, you raised a fantastic point, which is part of what we're seeing with these revolutions is how much more widespread the technology penetrates. You know, it's, it's not just the, the top 5%, the top 2% of people who can afford it. Suddenly, you know, gosh, uh, you know, every kid has his own cell phone and his own number. You know, it's, it's a, so, and it's not just in, in the wealthy countries, it's in the developing countries, it's in the, even in the least developed countries. You're seeing penetration out to 70, 80, 90 percent of the population of this world with these technologies. So, uh, yeah, incredible benefit in terms of at least getting information to them. So we've done a little history now of first, second, third, and fourth industrial revolutions. Um, and again, you know, who knows where the lines are between these things. Um, but at some point, there's some collective weight of technology that enables a change of lifestyle. Uh, and that is, I think, how we define these eras. Um, Smarter people than me are starting to say, well, we're really on the verge of a fifth. And in fact, some people are even kind of mapping out a sixth industrial revolution. We'll talk about that next year. But, but the fifth one, the fifth one, which is the title of the presentation. Uh, gosh, I looked for definitions of that, and I found 10 different definitions of what the fifth industrial revolution was. But a lot of them talked about harmonious. Hold on, let me, let me read this because I don't want to get it wrong the notion of harmonious human-machine collaboration with a focus on well-being of multiple stakeholders, employees, employers, I suppose the machines too. Probably the machines too. <laughs> exactly. So, so I don't know, uh, what do you guys think about that definition? Do you think uh, harmonious is, is a, an attainable goal? Lucius, why don't you start us off? Um, I guess it's a, it's a standard we want to achieve, but if it's if it's achievable, that's um, that's another question. But it's um, it's definitely something we should we should strive for to to achieve this, this harmony. And then, essentially, as as also also Awi now outlined, how do we 
how do we actually include AI and machines in that? So are there, do they have interests? Are they stakeholders? Should we somehow uh, care about you know, their, their perhaps well-being or their, uh, their interests? Or should it always be, always be human-centered? So I guess now, now we're coming to that question that should it be always human-centered? Should humans be in charge? Uh, but perhaps I'm, I'm going. I'm going well, that, that's a, that's no, a great, definitely great setup. Yeah, yeah. Um, the thing here is, um, uh, what I feel is, um, we should definitely uh, get the machines on board. <laughs> but <laughs> we need to draw a line. Uh, machines should augment and help us improve in what we do. Uh, yes, they might take a, um, a lot of our places and the jobs that we do, but then even our jobs would evolve in context with how we deal with these machines, right? Uh, so uh, it's, in, it's interesting to think that, you know, uh, what, where we draw the line kind of would define the benefits that we draw out of this. And also, you know, it, it, it's, it's like this, right? You try to improve on something, you have to give away something else. If you keep improving, how much machines are allowed to do, how much machines are allowed to influence you. There will come a time where you are limited in terms of what's happening or intervening in what's happening. Uh, automated uh, autonomous driving vehicles or for that matter, <laughs> you know, um, um, advanced autopilot systems. Uh, now there are talks about how much of power do you actually give them. And, uh, you know, there needs to be a point where ma um, humans should be able to override them, not the other way around. Because humans are inherently trained to think in ways that uh, we only tend to uh, mimic in AI systems. So, uh, you know, uh, it's pretty challenging to actually make the AI systems think like humans, because AI systems are basically part of how you train them. Right? what you want them to think, what you want them to work on. And uh, then what happens is as they keep improving, as you, as you keep them, uh, give them more uh, you know, autonomous power and you give them unsupervised learning capabilities, they tend to pick up biases. Now how do you address those biases so that it doesn't work against you? That's also a very interesting uh, challenge that we'll have to definitely address, if not in the fourth, definitely in the fifth industrial revolution because that's where these machines are truly going to affect us, especially in things like safety critical systems in industrial as well as in consumer products. So, so just so I'm clear, now between the, to me I can understand the fourth industrial revolution being one where humans have access to each other and they have access to information very seamlessly, very rapidly, and the, the sheer bulk of information is enormous. The fifth then really starts to introduce some additional element in the mix, and perhaps that's artificially intelligent driven machines. Um, and maybe it starts to take human interaction or human decision making out of the mix. The idea being that, again, I like the example of self driving vehicles. You know, I, I've heard quotes of, you know, in 10 years, uh, insurance won't, won't let humans actually drive the car or drive the truck. It'll have to be, you know, some, some computerized artificial intelligent one driving it because it'll have lower, lower insurance rates, you know, less likelihood of, of, of having a wreck. Um, so the societal issue there, if, of course, is, is that going to make humans happier? <laughs> or is... Is, is that something that people are ready to give up some authority on? Likewise, the creation of, of content, the creation of, of, of music, for instance. I, I've played around on a number of different platforms where it will generate music. Uh, we've been playing around with chat GPT around the office just for fun. Uh, amazing program in terms of its ability to generate content. Um, so exactly, if I, if I may react to this. so. Uh... In the era of creative industries, you obviously see a lot of works being created by, by AI. And that have virtually no, no human input. But then again, as I've announced that um, currently, at least in my understanding, and you know, correct me if I'm wrong, I guess AI can only work with the data that 
someone feeds it, either us humans feed data into it or you know, another um, machine feeds, feeds data. But I guess those um, decisions are still um, somehow limited. Maybe I sound, I sound too skeptical, but, but they are, I would say, confined to, uh, to, that, to that data. Uh, but, but okay, I'm, I'm diverting too much. So what I wanted to say with respect to creative industries, you can see uh, a lot of works, whether music, paintings, uh, AI is even able to emulate style of some artists. So you can say, right, this is your know, Rembrandt style, let me, let me recreate that. Um, but then uh, I guess it's about flexibilities we, we have in law. Because in copyright, we were able to show that, all right, we still have very strong, stringent copyright law, very long-lasting, but we were able to create neighboring rights or related rights that are you know, less stringent, last shorter, etc. So we were able to react to also a technological change in the end. So I guess we might, we might how to, yeah. uh, we we might how to how to do the same here. But again, um, I'm afraid that that the response from from law, whether from you know legislators or courts, is always um, much slower than the than the development of technology. So we get a response now to to questions of yesterday. I, I guess uh, before we jump too much into intellectual property and how it has to react and adjust, uh, I'm going to ask a couple more philosophical questions. Uh, do you think this is a, 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 a field leveling event? In other words, for, for so long, hundreds of years now, there have been first world countries who have had the highest lifestyle, the greatest wealth, the greatest lifespan. So many of the benefits that have come with, with certain technologies, the best medicines. Um, is this going to help level the field so other countries can rapidly rise to that level, or, in contrast, will it be something where capital is a substitution for labor and many people will simply have no jobs? Definitely it will help leveling. There would be, I mean, the odd case out where it would act against us, but in general, uh, Embracing technology has always been beneficial, but then, uh, you know, I'll give you an example. Um, in India, a few years back, the government wanted to introduce a, a universal identification system called Aadhaar, and uh, part of it was like you have to um, basically give your biometric details to the government, and that kind of like, you know, stirred up a huge row that people didn't want to give their uh, biometric details to the government. But then once you know the government was able to secure the confidence of the people, millions of people enrolled for it and today using that, the government is rolling out uh, you know, social programs. People, are, uh, people who, you know, who are basically in the villages who never ever thought of having a bank account have bank account. They handle more money through, through the cell phones than you know, actually touching cash, right? Uh, insurance, health insurance, um, also access to healthcare. It's all been being streamlined using this technology. So I'm giving a very simple example where once technology is deployed using, uh, after securing the interest and the confidence of the general masses, and once done correctly, it can actually do miracles. Mm -hmm. I much agree with, with Avinar here that uh, I would say technology is much more uh, available and affordable as it used to be. Uh, perhaps think of your first cell phone, you know, um, how many people, if, if you look globally, you know, uh, what's the percentage of people that could allow a cell phone in, uh, afford a cell phone in 1993? Mm. And what's the percentage of people that, that can do it now? Also, we have internet that's available virtually everywhere um, around the world. So I guess uh, if we focus on technologies that, that indeed empower people and are available and, and affordable, uh, I think this way we can, uh, we can share the benefits. 
Perhaps this was, this was much, much more difficult in the first two or even three uh, industrial revolutions where you needed a proper large computer, for instance. Yeah, so I certainly hear what you're saying, which is when there is an increase in efficiency in the delivery of services from government to citizen, uh, certainly there's a wider spread yeah. distribution of value what and benefits. Yeah. What technology does is, especially in terms of services, it brings down the cost, infrastructural cost of providing your services, you know, it brings it down massively, right? So then you can actually focus on providing the service, making it accessible to people, get value out of it. Uh, it can do societal good, but people have found ways to make money out of it also. So it works both ways, actually, if done correctly. Mm -hmm. You know, when we talk about efficient delivery of services, um, does that necessarily mean that some people are provided an inordinate number of services compared to others? In other words, an efficient system would, would price discriminate to provide the greatest number of, of, of value for cost in. Um, sometimes that conflicts with basic rights to, you know, to equal rights, equal rights to government services. Um, do you think that there will be some, some improvement in, gosh, um, I don't know quite how to word this, but when you have a, an artificially intelligent, massively in, you know, taught system that is now being used to create a distribution of services and value, will it be fair? And fair in the sense that it is fair with regards to constitutional rights of the people. Again, big philosophical question. I know this might be a snoozer, but, but uh, it, it crosses my mind. I think this is just extremely difficult to, to predict and perhaps we should I'm not, not saying we should, but uh, perhaps what we what we might see in the future is that also these constitutional concepts are going to be uh, re reevaluated or you know uh, rethought. So what what, what I mean I mentioned before is that if I understood that that correctly, so that you had this this country wide system in India, but in order to do that, you as an individual had to provide your data, and you might not be comfortable with that. You might see it as an infringement of your rights, or perhaps just, just something you need to give up. And I would say the same would go also with respect to development of, of AI and in fifth industrial revolution in general. So, what are we? What do we agree to give up? So, do we agree to um, give the power to machines to, let's say, decide on our rights? So, would we be okay to? for an artificial judge to decide our case in, in court. So this would definitely raise really important um, questions from the point of constitutional law, human rights, uh, fundamental rights and freedoms. Um, then again, I guess we would, we would have to have a, some kind of social consensus on that. So. Let's go ahead and start to turn our focus a little bit onto intellectual property. Um, everything we've talked about here involves enabling technologies of some sort. The computing power, the software, um, the know-how, the trade secrets. All of that has to have some sort of protection. Um, first of all, do you think that intellectual property as it is currently formulated provides adequate types of intellectual property rights for those enabling technologies? Can I take that? All right. <laughs> <laughs> the question uh, no one wants to answer. Yeah. Um, <laughs> I mean, uh, just a year back or so, um, there was a big row you know, where all of us read, like, where the AI systems can be, uh, you know, credited as, as inventors. Uh, I mean, um, patent offices would tell you, oh no, it needs to be a natural person, but is the argument actually that shallow, right? Because uh, 
the AI system is definitely helping you come up with a solution way faster. It can be questioned whether a human, even if he spent a lot of time, probably double or triple the 10 times the time, would he have been able to come up with that particular solution? Right? So here the mark goes to the AI system, right? But the AI system can be looked upon as a tool, right? Just like a calculator. You use a calculator, make some calculations, use that to come up with a solution and you get a patent for it. So why not look at as AI as a tool to achieve something and the person who has basically developed the AI system, optimized it and implemented it efficiently so that it's able to come up with a great solution, get that patent, right? So it works both ways. Um, I don't agree that, you know, we can just stop it at uh, AI has to be, uh, I mean, you can't have an AI inventor because it's not a natural person. Okay, so I guess so one of the very first issues is uh, authorship or inventorship. If a software tool, a particularly sophisticated one, uh, carries the weight and produces the song, the painting, perhaps even the invention, uh, do the laws that, as currently uh, formulated, allow for inventorship or authorship in that situation? Or is it so unclear that, that it will stymie the, the implementation of those technologies? As, as Margarita said earlier, it, it's about getting the money. So somebody's, somebody's going to be able to collect a royalty. So, so who is it? Is it the software or is it uh, the, the guy who wrote the software? The guy who's using the software to implement the product. Yeah. The credit goes to him. He should be making, uh, making money out of it. And uh, fortunately today we have come up with a lot of um, new technologies where we have a session in the afternoon also on that uh, for like NFTs and stuff like that. So today it's much easier to put your stamp on a digital asset or a digital artifact and just let it lose in the internet or the metaverse in the future. And then you can, because there is a tangible track to who created it and how much it is being used, how much money it's making, and where that money can be used, does it go back to who originally created it, or using smart contracts, we can actually basically find ways to take that money and put it to societal good also. I mean, it's enormous, it's beautiful if you think of it. Yeah, I would, yeah, I would definitely agree with that. Um, although with NFTs, I'm perhaps a little bit more skeptical, uh, especially from, from copyright point of view. I guess uh, you know, authors do how to have a say in uh, whether they are okay with their works being, being tokenized or not, because you can tokenize someone's work without, without being an, an, an author of that work. But uh, that's perhaps a discussion for another panel. Yeah. Um, so, so, so I guess one issue is, do the laws allow for ownership and inventorship? Another one is actually being able to track the distribution of royalty payments mm -hmm. to the correct owner slash author inventor. Um, exactly, and um, well, I, I would say, well, currently the answer would be that, uh, that it has to be a human at the end of the value chain. So whether, or at, at the beginning of it as a creator or inventor, but then also as a recipient of royalties. And uh, I guess we would probably have to think of, um, of incentives of intellectual property that uh, who does it incentivize? So in my opinion, it has been created as a system for incentivizing you know, human creativity, human inventorship, and very, very much human-centric. And uh, I guess now we have to ask whether the same kind of incentives also, feel, also fit in the current uh, industrial revolution. Yeah. So, if, so if you want to reap benefits as a society, do we still need the same, the same incentives? Yeah, so I think the, there has to be consensus that in fact this is a future we're looking forward, forward to. Uh, and then we have to look at whether law allows us to actually get there by promoting those enabling technologies. Because it, it's a constant evolution, it's not just chat GPT version 1.0, it's, 
it's, you know, every version after that as well. Um, I know in the United States, of course, we have struggled with how to protect software implemented business methods, as, as many of you in this room have probably dealt with. You know, the Supreme Court had their decision, Alice, a um, number of years ago. And, you know, we went from, from up here in terms of allowance rate down to somewhere below this stage in allowance rates. And, and it has just thrown a wrench into uh, so many software-related businesses. And those are, the, unfortunately, the very ones who are trying to create these enabling technologies. And so are they disincentivized out of that area of, of research and development um, as long as cases like that still exist? Or is copyright adequate? I mean, I, uh, we could also look at it from this point of view, right? The traditional IP protection regimes, copyrights, patents, whatever it is, they protect, right? They protect what you have done, right? Uh, we could also look at it from this point, right? Where we, technology is at the forefront of protecting your in, um, invention or your work, artistic work or whatever it is. Instead of uh, trying to find who's infringed, instead of acting on it, right? Use technology to first limit or find ways to limit how it can be copied and how it can be used, right? If I have created something, I want it to be used in certain ways and no other ways. I'm not gonna stop people from using it, but I'm only going to allow it to be used how I want it. What copyright and license agreements would do is on paper decide how it's going to be done. But using advanced, I'm giving a very um, primordial example because for me DRMs are primordial, but if you have advanced systems, DRM systems that work on how, who is using a particular digital asset in a certain way, what it is doing, what is the value it is creating, or is it doing any harm, it, all these things can be built in to, uh, along with the asset itself. And so as the asset is used and mutated throughout the chain, it's all being regulated and stopped at source. Wait, wait a second, wait a second. I, I thought you guys were for good and against evil. <laughs> I, I thought you were for widespread distribution of all this stuff so oh, everyone, we everyone in the world would have access and benefit yeah. and we'd all be harmonious. Yeah, but this is for well, the, What happened to harmonious? We're talking it's about more. misuse. <laughs> <laughs> but, I, I guess, I guess we are back. To, back to humans making decisions, yeah. right? So, yeah. uh, as, as a human, you have to you know you, you, have, you have to decide how works are being yeah. used. So, so, for instance, let's say I use this AI tool to create a painting in the style of of um, Rembrandt, and then uh, um, let's say I send a picture to Avi now, and then he licenses it to Netflix, for instance. Can I say that? Look, I you know, I never gave you permission to do that. Or can you just say that, well, but it's you know, not you who created it anyway? So uh, what we need here is a system uh, where as you give me transfer the work to me, it's not just the work, the content. It's a lot of metadata, a lot of smart contracts, which are the metadata associated with the system. So think of it this way, a 10 MB image is going to be a one GB file, okay? Let's look at it that way. And all these things are built into it, right? So the moment I do something which is against what we have agreed, the remaining 990 MB is going to work on it. The actual asset is actually just 10 MB, right? So we are talking about, th like, th that's what we meant, like, use technology to stop it. Because the traditional IP regimes are uh, basically, you know, on paper. They're on paper. They don't actually work in real time. Now, now everything we've talked about so far is kind of the easy cases. You know, whether I, I get to see that Rembrandt picture or not, it's not really that all that life-changing. You know, it's a nice thing. But, you know, uh, uh, I caught COVID twice. You know, isn't that crazy? I, I thought I'd only have to catch it once, but I caught it twice. But, I, you know, I got the vaccines and all that stuff, and I still caught it. Uh, and I, I remember the big outroar, uh, you know, Pfizer and Moderna came out with their vaccines fairly quickly, and there was, there was some discussion about, well, for the good of everybody, we should, you know, simply make those patents unenforceable or, or put them in the public domain. Um, 
so that other countries can manufacture those vaccines because you know that's that's the greater good that's harmony harmonious stuff um, is there a chance that there are certain technologies or certain inventions that are so important that we simply have to find some balance between rewarding the creator versus the needs of the many? I, I think so, yeah. And um, IP has already showed it. I would say, so you have, for instance, you have compulsory licenses. Right, you compulsory have, licenses. You have standard essential patents uh, where you, you, know, you, you, you just limit the initial uh, IP owner in the sense of what, what, what they can do with it. And uh, I don't know, it's, it's not really my area um, of, of you know, study or work, but, but I, I don't see or I haven't noticed a general backlash against those concepts of compulsory licenses or standard essential patents. So perhaps if it's something that everyone can agree that, right, this is something we need to have in order for, in order for the greater good, um, I guess there is, the, the, yeah, there, there's a good, good chance that we will come to, come to some solution. Also, um, just to add to what he said, I'm completely in line with what he has said, and I'd just like to, and to the point that it's not a question of whether we incentivize or not, or whether we put limitations to, you know, incentiving. Uh, what we need to think is, yes, definitely, there will be incentives, but who pays for it? Right, I, I, I tend to agree with that too, because compulsory licensing is, there's a version of that in copyright, of course. In, in certain law, uh, countries, there's also compulsory licensing with regards to patents. Uh, but it's a it's a it's typically based upon the patent owner not working his invention, uh, and so that doesn't necessarily um, keep the money from flowing in kind of a monopolistic pricing structure to the patent owner. Uh, and and I had talked uh, earlier about you know we talked about standards essential patents, and and yet those are are ones that are where the patent owner is limited. Uh, based upon his decision to enter into a group of some sort. Uh, and then we had tossed around this concept of societally e essential patents, also SEPs, but something that society would simply make the decision, in which case a government or a group of governments would still pay some sort of royalty to the patent owner. And maybe that's a better model for these enabling technologies for the fifth industrial revolution. Um, I really like that concept, so you should, I think you should tell us more about it once I, you, I, I filed, once you develop a little bit more of this. I, I filed a trademark already, so, so it's, it's, I've got that one. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, so yeah, I'm definitely much, much in favor of that. And also connecting to what, what both of you said, um, that who will pay for it in the end? If, we go, if you go back to, back to the COVID vaccine, um, you still need the, let's say, traditional R&D costs. So the question is, yeah, who will, who will pay for those costs if we are uh, to you know, release COVID vaccine, if we are not to protect it by IP, which would definitely be beneficial for the society, but then we also have to make sure that, that we have you know, new vaccines coming our way as well. Right, because I think you know, the, the call to um waive or invalidate or simply ignore those Pfizer and Moderna patents may have been a good short-term solution, but you know what happens when there's COVID-26? You know, uh, I think everyone in this room understands that risk. Uh, once you take away incentive, you know, I can't remember the, the old quote, but you know, burned once, twice shy, something like that. So uh, Once bitten, twice shy. <laughs> <laughs> once bitten, twice shy, of course. I think that was a famous song title too, but um, but you know what I'm saying. Um, so at least there there might be a new model for these enabling technologies that still provide incentive to the developers and yet spread the costs widely to everyone. So, so where do you think will will come from? Will it come from industry? Will it come from? Uh, <laughs> 
Um, no, U I... UN, some kind of general <laughs> societal consensus or from legislators? Great question, not sure. Um, I don't know, where would it come from? WIPO? So it has to be uh, probably something that the industry and the government can do, join hands and do, where part of it is initially funded by the government and the industry throws in their manpower and expertise doing it. And then whatever, say, IP is generated out of it, it is probably, you know, um, uh, used for the betterment, right? Because the government will should have, uh, with uh, you know proper agreements put in place, proper rights over those, right? Mm -hmm. But at the same time, uh, same time it won't, uh, you know, put limitations on what that particular company has done for that technology. So they are they should be able to make money out of it also. But then probably things like first right of refusal and things like that, you know, where the company who worked on it probably gets a license from the government or, you know, um, an agreement say, okay, you're gonna make it, you're gonna commercially, you know, uh, exploit it. However, these are the terms. The day you fall short of it, we have the right to give it to someone else who does a better job at it. Again, yeah, we're kind so of like getting back to it, compulsory license, but yeah, that's, that should, that's the spirit, I think. As I warned everybody before this uh, presentation started, this is a lot of kind of forward vision stuff because you know it's hard to know what the future is going to hold obviously but uh what we've seen is uh these these revolutions industrial revolutions are coming at a faster and faster pace and i think for us to think that uh this fifth industrial revolution isn't going to hit within the near term is is foolish and uh certainly our response has got to be within the legal realm and so it's good for us to start talking about, well, what does that mean? Does intellectual property still hold up the way it's currently drafted, or do we need to start thinking about exceptions if that's really the future we're looking for? Um, certainly, if it's not, then we can, we can change the laws to, to avoid it. Um, it's not going to be in the law books alone, right? It's not going to be part of some act or something like that. It's going to be something which has to implement technology so that it works. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, again, whenever technology is used, there will be resistance because nobody gives, wants to give away the trick up in their hat, right? If I'm a company who's supposed to basically give up something and mm -hmm. share it with the government, right? I need to know my interests are protected. How do we do it? Not on paper, nobody trusts paper. Right? Even if it's on paper, we can go to court and <laughs> make lawyers a lot of money, but then what does it do at the end of the day? Right? So we need to kind of like agree that this is what the technology is, this is how we're going to be use, uh, using it, and the moment someone deviates from it, today we do have technologies which can do that, right? Uh, not probably stop someone from physically doing it, but at least at the electronic level, at, the, at least at the digital level, track and record things. And stop people from doing something in real time, right? The thing is, we just need to have regulatory compliance over that, and then the moment it is implemented and has everyone's trust, then we'll actually see it work to the full potential. By the way, Lucius, I have an answer to your earlier question about how would I go about doing this, the socially... Uh, uh, essential patents, I would go to the European Parliament first and I'd have them come up with a directive on working requirements that somehow, you know, worked this in. And, uh, and because those directives are so powerful in terms of the requirement for the member states to have to implement them. And once Europe did it, I think other countries would start to follow. And that would be a good test ground. Yeah, I think it sounds like a good idea. Yeah, and also, Directives are, are quite flexible in the end, so they give flexibility to you know, member states to uh, implement some changes as well. So yeah, yeah, definitely, definitely a good idea. I'm out. <laughs> <laughs> and also, sorry, coming coming back to, but what what you said just previously that indeed law is quite slow and inflexible in in uh, responding to current current challenges. And uh, um, as Avi now said, that you should allow you know those who can use technology and can come up with 
new technology to simply do that. Um, but um, maybe I'm going to be a little bit skeptical now to say that um, with big technology changes, you also see some resistance from very strong incumbent players. So if you, um, especially an example coming from copyright, um, we could have had music streaming much earlier. We could have had the same remuneration models as we have now, let's say, let's say with Spotify. But it was just that record companies simply didn't want to go into MP3. They were like, no, we just want this current system that we have. We want to have, you know, I don't know, $20 per CD for 10 songs. And we just don't, you know, we, we just don't really want this, this new system because obviously we benefit from the old one a little bit more. So you do have disruptors that actually, um, that are pioneering the technological change, but sometimes you see, I would say, quite a big resistance from the incumbent players who are, who are happy with the, let's call it, old or, or current system. Mm -hmm. All right. Well, we've talked about industrial revolutions. Uh, I've always been fascinated by what causes actual revolutions. And, uh, you know, wealth distribution, of course, is, is one of the most important factors that leads to it. Um, I think we've got to avoid whatever um, gets done. This, again, massive concentration of wealth in the hands of the very few, um, so, that it's, so that it stays as an industrial revolution. Uh, I'm going to go ahead and open it up for questions. Any any comments? I, again, I know this is kind of a, a blue sky topic, but how many of you are starting to see some of the impacts of the fifth industrial revolution? How many of you are working in industries where you're already trying to kind of look forward to this uh, incredible integration of, of data analytics and maybe AI decision making? You can share your opinions, also need not be questions. <laughs> yes. Thank you for your presentation. It was very uh, fruitful and um, added so much. Uh, I have just um, some addings uh, and I would love also to uh, get your opinions, uh, get your point of view. Uh, actually, in front of us, we see uh, nowadays lots of um, actually AI and machine learning based um, cars or software or other kind of machines. They, they make lots of mistakes. They hurt people, they miscalculate. So, um, so we, we can just uh, see that um, they, are, they mustn't be that much autonomous. Uh, so the control mustn't be... Um, uh, let them let, let go. Uh, so do, do human beings must really control and monitor AI and machine learning based um, software or this kind of cars. So they need to uh, all the time, but not all the time, but we, uh, I don't know, maybe regulations or the best um, code of conducts, they, they must uh, really um, determine the, the, time, the time frame of this kind of monitor because uh, the codes can uh, can go out of control after a while, uh, but um, nowadays, of course, as you know, there is not so much uh, machine really based on AI, or um, they are just uh, learning. They are just at the stage of learning. So, but uh, later on, uh, the technology goes very fast and uh, they, uh, improves very fast. So, after a while, we can lose this control. So, who must be responsible of these machines? Uh, so that's why um, regulation must uh, determine um, this control um, uh, control points, and so uh, in all cases the, the creators, human creators, must be responsible all, of all of these um, AI and machine learning based um, software and tools, uh, because um, we we just need uh, these machines to facilitate um, and and reach our life, uh, but not to control our life. So that's, that's why the, the, uh, even um, during um, uh, nowadays, the, the decisions uh, are based on, um, they, they just make uh, people responsible of their creations. So you know, I, you. I, I think, uh, first of all, you're correct. The, the need for human control, I think, is 
would be very satisfying for us now. Um, the place I worry the most is um, in military applications where artificial intelligence is let loose. And, and that's actually in the field in some places in the world already. Um, you know, the idea that uh, you have artificial intelligence controlling targeting, uh, I think is a terrifying prospect. And, and yet I know some countries do that. Uh, I know even the United States, I'm sure, has invested heavily in that. Um, again, statutory restraint, I think, has to be put in place if that's the will of the, the people. Um, you know, you look at examples of the Boeing 737 MAX 8. You know, again, you know, what was considered a safety system ended up being a horrible, um, uh, it led to a horrible outcome. Um, so that said, you're right. I, I think uh, in so many situations, especially where lives are at risk, you, it certainly feels satisfying to think that there's a human who still has ultimate control. Um, I'm not sure that's where fifth generation or fifth uh, in, uh, uh, industrial revolution is necessarily going. Um, I know certainly like, uh, again, back with weapon systems, you know, we're talking about the sixth generation fighters now uh, having a lot of artificial intelligence controlling uh, adjacent drones. Uh, the networking that's a bit, that can, is, is so complex that humans may not be able to control it, especially if they're against an adversary who can do the same thing. And so I think there will be incentive to let go of that control uh, if the adversary has the same capability. Yeah, and, um, you know, um, there's something... Uh, moving to the fifth industrial revolution and everything we have just discussed now, what you've just said, uh, we now have uh, certification authorities, uh, you know, people like the FAA, or the ESA and other government. For I'm, I'm just talking about the aviation sector because I'm like you know part of it. But then we have like a lot of other government bodies also who are now insisting on something called explainable AI. So it essentially means you need to explain the decision making process of your neural net step by step almost, so that it is traceable and. For, for a AI-powered system to be certifiable, the government would ask for something like that. Right now, there, are, there is no framework for an AI-powered system uh, to be, uh, you know, certified. It's all on paper. People are thinking on it, right? But then if we are able to crack this particular... There's a lot of work which is happening, obviously, for explainable AI. But the day we crack that... Uh, it's going to go out a long way in helping us solve a lot of these problems. I agree with that. I mean, ultimately, we are, I, I guess we are, we are not ready, and maybe we shouldn't be ready to give up control for the benefit of AI. And a very good example with, you know, uh, autonomous vehicles, but... But I guess, I, I guess this also has some, some analogies, as David said, with... Um, with planes, also think about Concorde had one accident, but that was enough for just, just to shatter public trust in it completely. The same with autonomous vehicles. Uh, if this happens that an autonomous vehicle run over, uh, run over someone, uh, then the public trust is, is very, very low. So I guess we, we will still need um, um, need to how need to how someone who you know um, who will be able to able to control it, um, and then ultimately, m my kind of prediction is that AI will be doing all of decisions, but there would be kind of an appellate you know human who would who would then be able to control and have the final say say over uh, over AI. Yes, in the back. Hi. I'm sorry, my voice is a little... <coughs> okay. Um, <clears throat> I wanted to just kind of um, um, not really ask but comment on um, the other extreme of uh, using AI and ML in certain 
areas, certain sectors of the industry. For example, in the fashion industry, there's a lot of um, AI being used to generate new designs based on sales, what is moving, seasons um, in different parts of the world. And um, you know, you actually have programs now running to generate the latest trends and styles. And, um, and they actually end up doing really well. Uh, there are companies in India that produces jeans at one fourth the cost just use, by using AI um, models. Uh, my question is, um, if we start, I mean, control, um, something more on control is, if we start moving towards that in at such a rapid pace, uh, where do you see the whole creativity angle of humans, and how does that impact uh, the future? I mean, it looks like everything is uh, being generated. I'll, I'll tell you where I, th I think we're heading, which is um, intense personalization of, of everything that we touch. Exactly. And, and whether it's the clothes we put on or the content we view, um, I did a presentation about a year and a half ago on uh, AI-generated entertainment content. Um, you know, AI can generate the images of the of a of a person. It's not a real person; it's just a, an image. And of course, it has a lot of machine learning of what you've liked based upon what you've looked at on the internet. Uh, it can produce storylines uh, based upon your record of what books you've read. It can produce background music based upon your music purchases, and it can generate that as computing power goes up and up. You know, for all you know, you might be getting it, you know, every day, brand new personalized content. Um, is that a good thing? I, I don't know. You know, it's, it's always just going to feed you stuff that you, it knows you like. Sometimes the human spirit's better when it's presented something it doesn't like. Um, you know, sometimes the human spirit is, is fed by labor uh, rather than having it taken away by, by machinery. So um, that's where I think AI is leading us, uh, hyper-personalization of everything we touch, every experience we have. Uh, yeah, so what he just said, we can actually, we, we do have technologies like 3D printing, which can be used to do these things. So, uh, I mean, my opinion would be like, uh, we, we have to look at things in terms of uh, um, this uh, a bit differently in the sense that, People who are making jeans, coming up with jeans at one foot the cost. Yes, cost is basically what they're giving, but there is a different market, and probably th that this they would also find themselves there because uh, we are not going to end up with just people making jeans. It's enabling the customer to get the type of print he wants, the wash, right, the fashion, the cuts. If you give the customer a tool to decide this is the jeans I want, personalization, and then give it to him. You're changing the way you're doing the business, but that's where you have to constantly basically evolve and find yourself in a position where you constantly provide value. As long as you give value to the customer, you're not going to get, uh, become irrelevant. I agree with that. and. Uh I think what, what we're seeing in, in the fourth and fifth industrial revolution is that um, you know, all of us can be designers, creators. We want to be, it's much easier than it, than it used to be. So uh, I would be very, very positive about that. Again, a negative, a negative aspect, is, as, as David has highlighted, is that it somehow locks you in a, in a bubble. It tells you what you like, even though it might it is based on what you have liked previously, and now you may like something else, or you might want to try something else, but you will never know because you, um, because because the air doesn't suggest it to you. Mm -hmm. uh, so this is this is an, the negative aspect that we have to we have to take into account. But uh, but on but on the positive note, I think it allows all of us to be involved in a in a creation, invention, design. So that's, that's really good in my opinion. All right. Well, thank you all very much. Oh, wait, do we have one more? Somebody get a mic to him? Come on up.
I was uh, very much interested in what you said before, also because for the last 30 years I was uh, on the other side of the table. I was an examiner in the European Patent Office. Uh, my personal experience is that uh, the patent offices normally try to simplify the things and try to use what is already in the table. I wouldn't be so worried concerning the changes that from the point of view of uh, the obtaining a patent uh, or not uh, is, uh, could come out from this uh, fourth and fifth revolution. Because uh, my personal experience is that uh, the European Patent Office, which is more or less the benchmark on this type of uh, uh, decisions has already established a framework uh, that will work for the next, I believe, uh, 10 years probably, which is the computer implemented inventions. Mm -hmm. uh, if you follow this framework, uh, you wouldn't have any, any problem. Concerning the simplification, we can see with the Dabus uh, decisions, they simply practically refused uh, to give an opinion because they said we have already an article that says that uh, the inventor must be of patent must be a human being, so there is no point that we enter further in the in the discussions. And uh, concerning your statement before that uh, it would be very useful if you want to be effective uh, to operate at the level of the European Commissions. I'm not completely agree in, in agreement with you because I believe that uh, where you should uh, uh, to work uh, to make some pressure, it is the larger board of, board of appeal of the European Appellate Office. This is the body that uh, normally takes the decisions, take decisions that will last for many years that they will affect the life of anyone involved, uh, involved in the internet of property. Good. Thank you. Thank you for your comments. If I, if I may, uh, th thanks so much for, for this contribution. This is, this is really, really enlightening. And perhaps we can have a chat on this later. But um, essentially, I'm a little bit skeptical in this respect because um, what patent offices and courts essentially do in a case when you have to you know, decide whether you register a patent, you only look at the current statutory requirements. And obviously you might have an opinion that, right, should be different, but you do have to apply current law. So yes, uh, I would say it's really beneficial if, you know, if a patent office can come up with a set of guidelines or you know, some soft law. Uh, but in the end, they would only, only apply, uh, apply existing law. And this is what also uh, English Justice Arnold said in the, in the Dabus case, that although they probably would have a different opinion on how the law should develop, in applying current law, they have to say that, uh, that you can only register human as an, as an inventor. Um, but they're happy to, happy to have a discussion on that. Thanks. Thank you all very much. Uh, I know it's, a, it's clouded with vagary in it because uh, it has to be. The nice thing about it, of course, is we had great discussions about science fiction topics because it quickly devolves into uh, science fiction, what if uh, this happens in the future kind of stuff. But uh, I think it's going to be here before we realize it. And uh, as uh, legal professionals, it's going to be partly your job to know how to navigate it. So thank you. All right. So well, thank you so much, uh, moderators and speakers. So now I would request uh, our moderator to present the mementos to our speakers.
Hi, everyone. Uh, I think it's the last session before the lunch break, so uh, we have a huge uh, responsibility to make this session very lively and dynamic. Um, you know that when you are in a trial, normally the uh, defendants that are in the first uh, session in the morning, because the judges are fresh, they had their coffee and breakfast, they have more possibility to get a favorable response, whereas those that are <laughs> sustaining their hearing just before lunch, uh, with the judges, they have a sugar peak that is really going down. They have a really less favorable uh, possibility to get a favorable uh, judgment. So we have a really the responsibility to set the bar high. Hi, everyone. I think we have one panelist that is not be able, is that able? Okay, but I think that you guys are going to compensate brilliantly for the absences. So we're talking about the UPC, which is the Unitary Patent and Unified Patent Core System. I'm uh, Alice Flacco, General Counsel of a healthcare company, Microperscientifics, headquartered in China, but with antenna bit everywhere in the world. We are considering to expand in the Emirates, and we are currently operating in more than 21 uh, countries. And I myself manage the legal function, which is comprised of legal litigation and IP. And actually, Olaf is my service provider for Europe, and I could only highly recommend his uh, excellent services. And I manage IP, uh, managing um, 1,200 1, patents in an IP uh, function is entails several challenges. Budget is not uh, a minor challenge as we will see also with the strategic options that we have when choosing what kind of uh, UPC system to opt for. So back to the uh, today's topic, with the unitary patent, a unified patent court, as you know, is a proposed system for the European Union which will provide a single unitary patent and single court system for the enforcement of patents throughout the EU. And this will currently uh, replace the, this will replace the current system in which patents must be registered and enforced separately in each EU, EU member state. I will let my panelists talk about the technicalities, but um, what I can add in um, as an in-house perspective is that, as I was saying, the considerations to be made with regards to companies' um, constraints and companies' budget are numerous. When formulating strategic options that Olaf will um, introduce, there are several considerations that need to be made with regards to a company's budget, for example, which is, um, which is um, super important for the bottom line. The cost, the cost of implementing each option shall be carefully considered. The option that requires the least amount of investment might not always be the best option. The ROE, the return on investment, the ROE for each option shall be evaluated, and this will help to determine which options will provide the greatest financial benefit for the company. Budget constraints, of course, uh, shall be taken into account. Even if an option has a high ROE, it might not be feasible if the company does not have the financial resources to implement it. Prioritization. Of course, it's important to prioritize the option and determine which ones are the most important for the company to pursue. Flexibility, long-term versus short-term. Cost-benefit analysis shall be uh, performed on each option to determine if the benefits outweigh the cost and also uh, prepare a contingency plan in case the budget does not meet the projected amount on any unforeseenable circumstances arise. And of course, it's also important to, co to consult with your friends at the financial department or other relevant stakeholders to ensure that budget considerations are accurate and realistic. This is the most important feedback I can provide on a general counsel in house point of view perspective. But now I leave the floor to my panelists. Uh, Olaf, shall I introduce you or would you prefer you do it? 
<laughs> Great. <laughs> Great. So, okay, I'll leave you. I'll leave you the floor. Thank you. Thank you, Alice. Thanks for your kind introduction. Oh, that's quite loud. Oh, I need to check how I get back. Maybe you can help me. I put this away. So thanks for being here. Uh, I'm happy also to uh, contribute to this nice conference. And uh, we just heard about an industrial revolu revolution. And this is also a kind of small revolution. But we waited decades for this. I remember 20 years ago, we were uh, interest talking about a community patent. And now we got something. but. To be honest, it's not a real community patent. This is someone in something in between. <laughs> so you still have some national patents and you will have a community patent in combination. So you can imagine this is a quite complex system and for strategic issues, this will also be provide many new tools to, to use in connection with dealing with your competitors. That's why this is a good topic here to talk about such strategies. And it came out as a rabbit out of the head. Suddenly it was there. It's still not there. We're still waiting for Germany to deposit the ratification. Um, and this is the so-called gatekeeper. So Germany will be the gatekeeper for the start of the system. That has been agreed because we are uh, the most, the largest filing country in the EPC. So here is an idea of the timeline. And as Austria signed the protocol for provisional application in December, this provisional application period started and currently current uh, judges are trained and selected and all the administrative requirements are built up so that the system can start. But we still have delays, so we thought it will start in the, in the beginning of this year, but now it turns out that it might become June, 1st of June, because Germany is expected to uh, do the deposit in February, maybe. And so we will have a start in 1st of June with this new court system. And an important issue is that there will be a sunrise period before the start. This is three months, uh, because you can decide whether you will be in the system or not. And actually, you can't decide that you're in the system but there are, that because there are still risks, but you can decide that you will be not in the system. This is important to know. Uh, during a transitional period of seven years, which may even be extended to 14 years, um, you can still be forced into the system or forced out of the system. This is a, there's a quite high risk in this all. And uh, I will come to the details later. Uh, so what is the legal background? As you can see here, it consists of two EU regulations. So you see this is only for EU member states. This is one thing, of course, it's a kind of community patent. So it can only be for EU member states. So there is a first regulation which deals with the unitary patent. This is the kind of small community patent. And there will be a second regulation which deals with translation requirements. And the material law is the UPC agreement, which has been agreed about 25, uh, with 25, among 25 member states. And then we will have a procedural law. These are the rules of the procedure of the Unified Patent Court. Now here you see what's, what is new. We, you see, so far we had a system where when you have an innovation, you can file a PCT application and then you can decide what to do in Europe. And so far you had two branches. You could file nationally in different countries directly, in Germany, France, Italy. And now you have, and you have the option to go directly via the EPO, which is a central examination. And after grant, you need to decide where to validate. 
So again, you will have a bundle of national patents. So we never had a European patent as such. It was always a bundle. And if you don't validate, you have nothing in the end. This is very important to see. And now what is new? You have now the same examination, but um, in the end you can request for a unitary effect. That means you will then have, for these member states that participate in the UPC, you will have a unitary patent, which is one territory, one patent. One patent. And this is the new thing which we have now. We had it actually already in a very small thing between Swiss and Liechtenstein. So if you decided to validate Swiss, you already got Liechtenstein on top. That was the same principle of unitary effect in a small way. <laughs> so this is the present system of the EPC. The European Patent Convention is the basis for the present EP filing system and patent system. You see we have a lot of member states, 27 EU member states, then we have some non-EU countries that participate, and where we have extension states, these are in Europe, and validation states outside of Europe, where you can just extend the protection. So what is the unitary patent? The unitary patent, as I said, is one validation and one patent for several EU member states that take part in this new system. At present, these are 17, and so we we'll get one patent for 17 states. As you can imagine, you will have a cost benefit, because you will, we will have to pay one annuity for these 17 states. This annuity is calculated based on the four most filing, largest filing countries. And so if you validate in only one or two countries, you will have not a cost benefit. This is uh, one thing to consider. So this cost benefit has been weighted against an additional cost of a full translation, which is required during another transition period of six to 12 years. But, as you know from the London Protocol, there are still some member states which require translation. So it's not clear whether this is a real disadvantage. But if you file, for example, in Germany and France, there was no translation so far, and so this would be an additional cost for the translation. And there is a risk, of course, of exposure of valuable IP rights because this whole unitary patent can be destroyed in a single procedure before the UPC. So this is important to consider. So far, you had national proceedings in all the EPC member states, and now this will be a single court action, so there is quite some risk. As I said, we have one renewal fee. This provides additional advantages because with the one renewal fee, there is only one office where you have to pay for these 17 states. And so this, of course, provides uh, savings for administrative purposes. So you don't have to uh, contact all your local attorneys, law firms, or service companies to take care of the payment of these annuity fees. So it's a single annuity process for all these states. Um, 17 countries, as I said, here you see where they are. And apparently you see UK is not in the system because they decided for Brexit. So you will, in any case, you will still have to validate your European patent after grant in the UK, and you also see Spain is not there. So there are some important countries, and Switzerland anyway, uh, which are not included. So here you have a list of the 17 EU member states which participate in the system. 
Then, of course, we have the non-EU countries which will never participate, so we will always, in the future, we will always have some validations left. And some EU countries decided not to take part. This is Spain, Croatia, and Poland. And it looks like they will, for a long period, will not participate or forever. But this is very important to, not to notice. Um, when you decide this year to obtain a unitary patent, this will be fixed to the 17 countries. And even if new countries will join this system, this patent will not be extended. So this is, becomes very complex because in the future we, you will have to check when has this unitary patent been granted and entered. And you have to check which member states had been in the system at that time, which makes it quite complex. Maybe in 10 years, you will have different unitary patents which diff with different coverage, which is quite important for licensing agreements or for checking um, in FTO uh, whether you infringe this patent. So this is, as I said, we have two aspects. We have the unitary patent on the one side, and we have the court system, the new court system. And this is very important. So we have actually a completely new court system in Europe. It's a civil court that decides cross-country for 17 member states. This is a very new thing uh, on, this, on this basis from with the first instance and the second instance. So far we had the European Court of Justice, but this was on a higher level. But now we have it right from the beginning. And uh, you see, we, have, we will have different divisions. We will have a central division, we will have a regional division and a local division. And I will come to the jurisdiction soon. And uh, the second instance will be in Luxembourg, Court of Appeal. And uh, the first instance will be spread over Europe, over the member countries. There will be local divisions in Germany, France, Portugal, and many member states. These divisions, the central division, has two legal qualified courts and one technical uh, judge and one technical qualified judge. This is important because the decisions made there include technical and legal matter. And in the local and regional division, you will have only a legal qualified judge, legally qualified judge, judges because their infringement is decided, but they can add an optional technical qualified co judge. And this can be done by the parties as agreed or on discretion, discretion of the court. The second instance, the Court of Appeal can have three or has three legally qualified judges and two technically qualified judges. So this is the constitution. An interesting uh, Judge Grabinski, which was judge of the German um, Federal Court of Justice, he is the president of this court. And um, we have some discussions among our uh, colleagues that he is known as a patent proprietor friendly judge. So we have some, we are, we have some worries that this whole court system will be a bit patent proprietor focused. And this remains to be seen from this case law. So if there is a declaration of non-infringement or a revocation ad action, you will directly come to the central division. And the central division has his head in Paris and has uh, a division in Munich. Originally, there would be, have been three, three locations, but as uh, the Great Britain decided to exit the, the EU, we have no, uh, no division in London anymore. It is discussed that, but this is in the law, so we can't just change it. Uh, it is discussed whether there will be a change of the law to have it maybe in Milan or or could also be in the Netherlands, in Amsterdam. That's not fixed yet. And this will be a declaration of infringement and revocation, or if a US company sues someone, 
he might also en end up in the central division. And the local and regional divisions can be, uh, there is some forum shopping. It can be based on the place of infringement or based on the domicile of the party. Of course, the parties can agree to bring the action before the division of their choice if they want. One important thing is, as you might know, in Germany, there was an advantage or a disadvantage, how you see it. We had this um, separation of litigation, of infringement, and of validity. We had the German patent court, and we have the civil courts for the infringement. So this is called the bifurcation. And here, the system provides for both. So if there is a counterclaim, for revocation during an infringement action, uh, the court can proceed with both actions. He can refer the whole case to the central division, or he can stay and have validity decided by the central division. So this is a thing which is also interesting. So the German judges, they told us that they will favor uh, doing both at their court. So what are important issues under the new system? Uh, this is uh, just, just some uh, reminders to be considered. So when we will have the unitary patent this year, so after grant you will have to file a request within one month and you can say, I want to have the unitary patent, the unitary effect. But then you can't validate in these countries. So it's always either unitary or validation nationally during a transitional period of seven to 14 years. But uh, or if you have the unitary patent, you will be in the UPC system necessarily. But double protection is allowed. This is also a new thing. So far when you have granted a European patent or validated in Germany and you had a parallel germinal priority application of, or patent, this was deemed, uh, this had no effect. And now, with this new system, because it's a new court system, you have the option that you have a double protection. So you can have the patent with unitary effect, and on top you can have a national patent for one of these member states, which are covered by the UPC. So this is quite interesting in my view, because this is a new tool in your toolbox, because you can decide, I go nationally, or I go via the whole territory of the UPC, when I have a litigation in mind. But what can you do if, if you just say, oh, I'm, I see too much risk in this system, then I have the option to file an, a request for opt-out. This is the sunrise period. And the sunrise period has been established to make sure that this opt-out request will be valid. Because if you file an opt-out request and a third party files an action with the UPC court, this opt-out request may not be valid if the, re if the action was filed before your date of the request. And one disadvantage of this opt-out request is that you will then have no double protection option. So if you file an opt-out, your national patent will have no effect in the state, in the member state. Important, a validly filed opt-out request is effective for the whole life of this uh, patent. So this is good, so you don't have to wait for the transitional period and then something may change. This is valid for the whole. And, but you have only one opt-in. This is important, so you can't opt-in, opt-out <laughs> as you want. It's one opt-in, but it's a good thing where you can say, I opt out and then I wait how the system establishes, and then I say, now I opt in and sue my competitor. <laughs> this is a good prediction. Then we have other um, important issues. This is the three month sunrise period, as I just said, during which you can file the opt-out re request without any risk. Then. These are two very important things, five and six. So if central proceedings are commenced and you're in the system, you can't opt out anymore. And on the other way around, if you have opted 
If you have not opted out and there is a national proceeding, you cannot opt in anymore. You see, there are, these are important tools in an FTO uh, to check what is this, this, this EP. It will be in the register. Has he opted out? Has he not opted out? And then you can think, you can force, you, you can force him in or throw him out. Okay, risk and opportunity. As I said, we have the central, as a risk, the central revocation. So you lose your whole, your patent for all 17 member states. And so far you had all the member states separately, if there was invalidation required. Annuity cost savings, of course, yes. Then we have the geographic portfolio management. This is very important to consider. You have only one patent. So far in the, in the present system, you could decide, uh, maybe I abandon in one country, I keep the patent in another country. So this was very flexible system. But now you always stay with 17 states and you can't decide after 10 years or so, I let it lapse for a country only. The territorial scope, of course, is simply simplified validation process. As I said already, we have the centralized litigation, which is, of course, positive for the patent owner. And maybe one um, risk is that licensing agreements might be more complex, because if you want to license the patent in only one or two countries, you have the whole unitary patent, which provides, of course, more administrative, administrative measures. So, okay, the strategic options, as I said, you can stay out of the whole system. You can do a so-called long-term opt-out. So you just don't use, you just don't file EP applications anymore. We expect that this might be uh, the case for some of the clients that they start filing Germany, France, Italy separately as in very early times. You can, you can leave the back door open. You can say, okay, I opt out and decide later whether I opt in when I want to go on litigation with this patent. So, of course, you always have the risk that you are forced out by a national proceeding, by your competitor, for example. And we have the start into a an <laughs> And uh, how you say, unclear future, in a foggy future, you say, okay, I join the system and let's see what will happen, how the judges will decide, how the case law will be. It will be similar, but uh, there are differences, of course. There is a small thing just to see whether you opt out or not. We, we have to set as a, as a very rough idea, if it's a key patent, you should opt out because it's so risky that the patent will be invalidated for all these countries. Of course, if the key patent is a strong patent, you say there is no prior art, and the, the, it is quite sure that this will not be invalidated, then you can join the system. The other question is if you have grant, granted an EP, an EP application, what will I do, unitary patent or not? Here you have also a structure. What is addition? In addition comes in is the cost sensibility. So if it's a cost sensible thing, you should decide for the EP bundle because then you can reduce the costs by validating in less countries. And one thing is EP application, what you can do now. This is also a new tool for your box. You can after filing the EAP application, you can draft narrow claims, which are well distinguished from the prior art, and get a unitary patent, and you can branch off a you can file a divisional or branch off a utility model and go there with the probably broader claims to have an additional national um, IP right. So the last slide, steps to prepare. So what is now important for you? Because the system starts in June and in March, we will have the sunrise period. So you should check your portfolio about which are the important patents, which are less important, which will be in the system, and which not. You should check whether close to grant applications, you have received the 71.3, um, whether you want to have this delayed 
to take part in the system or not. And of course, this is important also, but not so critical, transactional matters. So contracts, agreements should be checked um, about responsibilities for litigation because you don't want to be the, the global company yourself that forces you out of the system by having a national procedure somewhere. And of course you should decide whether to request unitary patent of any existing application. Thanks. <laughs> I hope it was clear for you and valuable. Thank you, Olaf. You can see uh, how technical this is and how careful the choices must be assessed. And the needs of each, each specific company is also the trade-off in order to choose whether to, uh, to participate in the UAPC or not. I will go to my next panelist. If you can introduce shortly, and then I will leave you the floor entirely. I can, I can, I can introduce myself. So my name is Manuel Giesen. I'm a patent attorney at Gulded Partner, a patent law firm at the very heart of Berlin, central, the capital of Germany. And I will just add some further aspects on the UP and the Unified Patent Court uh, that, that Olaf just uh, missed out or did not mention because of his... Uh, presentation and the assumed time of, of 20 minutes for the presentation, so I will, will go on and afterwards we will both be uh, aware of your questions and we really like to answer you and we will also like to discuss with you in the coffee breaks and the whole next two days. So I will, I will skip some slides. Uh, yeah. I, I think I'm fine. So go to presentation. Yeah, I might skip some slides, not because I just don't want to show you, <laughs> because just it's, it's a repetition of what Olaf already mentioned and already said. So. Let's go back one step and just think about what is Europe. First of all, Europe is uh, a continent, not a confederation. Yeah. Uh, Germany, uh, Europe geographically comprises approximately <laughs> 46 different nations. It means that uh, yeah, there are nations like Turkey or Russia that are also geographically belonging to Asia as well as Europe. And among these 46 nations, 36, 38 nations are members of the European Patent Convention. And 26 nations are members of the European Union. So we're talking about approximately 500 million inhabitants and 500 million potential customers. So um, as Olaf already mentioned, in the very beginning of the unified unitary patent, there will be 70 nations taking part of the system. There are eight further nations who intended to take part in the near future. And there are two countries, or well, three countries, uh, namely Spain, Poland, and Croatia, who just don't want to join the system and don't have the intention to join in the near future. It's like the European uh, currency systems. Not all members of the European Union are also members of the European uh, currency systems. So sometimes European is not that united. <laughs> and it might seem. So I will skip that slide. Yeah. In the system, existing system, we have a great European patent system for the litigation, for the prosecution. So you can file one application 
and you can get, if you get the approval and the patent granted, you might get validate in, in 38 member states. So one single application, examination, and there's also one possibility to get rid of a European patent, of, of, a, of, a, yeah, of a European patent. There is a central uh, possibility of an opposition, but only in the nine months after grant. So uh, in the nine months period after the grant, you, if you're in an infringement case, you can also file for uh, file an opposition and try to get rid of the patent on that way. But afterwards, this uh, European patent becomes a bundle of separate independent national patent, patents, as Olaf already mentioned. And then you have to file invalidity in every single country. The patent was uh, validated. So this bundle becomes, uh, right now, this, this big bundle of, of flowers becomes uh, almost a single flower in every vase after the grant. And what we're looking for is the opportunity to put those flowers in a vase and keep it conservated for the lifetime of a patent. So the aim for a unitary patent is as long as, is as old as the European Patent Convention itself. The idea started like 1973 when I wasn't even born. So the idea is still there, and in 2023, uh, 20, we are on our best way to get it in place after almost 50 years. So as you have learned, not all parts of the European Patent Convention are member states of the European Union, and not even all member states of the European Union are taking part in the unified or in, are part of the unitary patent or in, part of the unified patent court system. So I will skip it because it's... So in the filing, there is no big change. You file for, you go for a European patent. You need to file a translation into English, German or French as official language of the European Patent Office. And after grant, you have to file translations in the other two languages. Or you have to file uh, transitions of the claims into the other official language of your course. So no change at all. After grant, it's a bit, there's something new. So you have to file a full, if it's filed in, is the patent application or the patent is granted in, the whole script is granted in English. You have to file a translation in another in, in a second language of the unit uh, of the European Union. It must not be a country that is taking part of the new system. So you can also file a translation into Spanish, though so Spanish will not take part of the system. Quite uh, not really understandable, but that's the way it is. And if it's filed in German or, Eng uh, German or French, you need to file a further translation into English. So, I'm going back. Well, we're going back to what is uh, the main topics, litigation and money. So, the 17 states taking part in the unified patent uh, or are part of the unitary patent or, and taking part in the unified patent court system stand for approximately 306 million people in the GDP of approximately 12 trillion US dollar. So in comparison to the US, it's a bit, little bit smaller, but uh, this will be the third greatest U, uh, economic system after the United States and China. So China, I think, is about 18 
trillion US dollar, and the US is still the largest economy of the world. So what makes uh, unified, uh, the unitary, yeah, the unitary patent uh, valuable? When you look at Europe, you have uh, companies and uh, European companies, or many European companies have um, production facilities in different countries. So what uh, is normally like we, what we did in the old system is we went for the biggest economies like Germany, France, Italy, and validated a European patent in, let's say, the three states. But what for companies from, what, what was pretty difficult in the past was we had a German company with uh, production facilities in Slovenia, for, for, for example, and they just uh, shifted the production from Germany to Slovenia. And so you had no further, if, if you just validated the patent in Germany, France, and Italy, you had no further option to uh, put some really sharp sword on the production itself. So you could only uh, stop the patent infringer by filing uh, yeah, in the main markets. If it was in, in something that was uh, yeah, for, for a local market or was produced for export in, in other countries, it was quite difficult, and we all think that the unitary, the unitary patent will help a lot to um, stop infringement, even if there's production look, relocation in, within the U, European Union. Okay, that's what all of mentioned. So let's talk a little bit about costs and what is happening within the next few years. So um, yeah, we're talking. Or let, let's look at a European patent that is validated in Germany, France, Italy, and the Netherlands for for example. So, you will cover, with a, with a European patent like that, you will cover approximately 75% of the GDP. And uh, it depends on what are your main markets within the US, uh, within the UE. Um, you will uh, have to file lawsuits in every single country to, to get your money. With the unified patent, you see the price for the annual fees is higher. But if you add uh, or you sum up the, the fees for the four countries, it's very, very comparable. So if you are already, you're already thinking about a validation in three or more uh, nationals of the of three or four states in the uh, European Union, the unitary patent might be a good idea in the future. So you get the other 13 countries almost for free. Now we, yeah, keep in mind that you have to file additional validations for the Great Britain and Switzerland and the other non-EU countries if you want to cover the whole European market. But uh, that's the way it is. So Switzerland and Great Britain will not, most probably not join the European Union in the near future. The <laughs> UK just left our system and Switzerland uh, always tries to stay neutral and will most probably also not follow. 
So I've just made a comparison of, of costs and markets. So if you file a national patent in Germany, uh, you pay uh, an amount of about 13,000 Europe and cover uh, 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 about 82 million potential com customers. So it's 3.2K heavens per euro, yeah? <laughs> or 3.2 potential clients per euro that you get covered with your patent. If you have a European patent and for national validations in, in Germany, Great Britain and France, you pay almost double the money, but you cover uh, more than 300 million, uh, more than 200 million people. So it's a little more, it's, uh, you get for your money, so you get 8.2 thousand potential clients per euro, per euro. And if you file for a unitary patent and additional uh, national patent in, or uh, if you validate the European patent as a unify, unitary patent and an additional, uh, additional patent in Great Britain, the costs are, are, are for sure higher, but uh, you get almost 10,000 clients per euro. So keep it in mind, uh, you always have to look at your markets. You had always don't only look at the money. Um, if it's a very valuable patent and you have a broad market, like almost every single country in the European Union or in Europe, then it might be a good idea to file for a unitary patent and for national patents in the non-EU states. So, costs for litigation, of course. Um, of course, the, co the costs for the, co for the court are also higher than in many national um, law systems. But it's uh, also something, um, yeah, okay, uh, out of value for money. So the court fees are higher. You have the option of a general attack of a granted patent, of a granted unity, unitary patent. And also, um, there is an so also the, the potential money that can be recovered for attorneys is higher in the new system than in many law systems or in many national law systems. So uh, what makes our what makes our work a little lighter and might help us is that we can really recover the costs we have for litigation and not be kept by uh, an insufficient amount. So, um, yeah, I will come to the end. So, um, I will just turn over to you and give you the time for questions and answers now. Are, do you recommend that, or are you allowed to use uh, expert witnesses to help prove up damages in the unitary patent court? Yeah, that's generally, yeah. that's generally uh, foreseen in, in the UPC agreement, so you can have witnesses and expert opinions, but it's, I think it's an, on the discretion of the court, but you can present it. And the damage calculation is similar to the present system in Germany and other European countries. So you can have uh, 
the royalty, release of royalty, or you can have uh, the infringer's um, profit or the lost own profit. So you have these different things and uh, usually you can use expert opinions also in, in uh, validation cases, in, in revocation cases. So um, this is, is foreseen, but I think it's in the, on the discretion. So it's not necessarily that the court will accept it. Yes. Um, so thank you, first of all, for both presentations. They're very informative. Um, I represent uh, various research institutions and enlightened human agreements, and we often have uh, contractual clauses that give out mandatory jurisdiction for patent uh, violations. Uh, so I'm a bit confused. What would my advice be? Yeah, this is a bit, this is really a complex thing and a good question, of course. Um, but um, first of all, it should be made clear who is responsible for filing opt-outs. This could also be done in license agreements, as now you have for an exclusive license. Normally, the licensee can also litigate, and this is important to have such uh, things in in the agreement. And important is also. Uh, if there is something about litigation, it should always be centrally controlled. So not that one that your your daughter company in Italy files uh, a national suit and you're you're knocked out of the system. This is important that these things are clearly regulated in such agreements. This uh, could be a reason to opt out or even to go the national route. So if you, if the licensee, this is what I mentioned, if you have the unitary patent and the licensee needs uh, the license only for two countries, for two member states, it is real, cri really critical and so far we have no real advice how to deal with this in license agreements. So you, actually you should, the license should be maybe adapted to this reduced territory but of course, he, he has actually a license. If you have a unitary patent, he would have a license for the whole territory. Any other question? Yes. No, yeah, checking your portfolio, uh, because a few years ago, I think around 10 years ago, a study was made uh, in various European countries about the number of patents which were invalidated by the court when there was a counterclaim for uh, invalidation of a patent. And in the big European countries, Germany, UK, France, the big, big European countries concerning uh, patent litigation, around 60% of the patents which were uh, subject to a counterclaim were invalidated because of, in fact, the poor quality of uh, the work of the patent offices. And therefore, you may have uh, patents which are important for you uh, as a company, but which are in fact very weak. And uh, when you will decide if you want to opt out, you should take that into consideration. Uh, it's very important because obviously if you do not opt out, as Olaf said, 
your patent will not be invalidated in one country, but it, it will be invalidated for the 17 uh, countries member parts of the UPC. Very important point. <laughs> Thank you. Last question? Actually, two, yeah, great. We can take two. So my question is really short. Yeah. Uh, are utility models covered by this? No. no. Okay. There, there's no European utility model. So there's only national utility models. My name is Diana, I am a European patent attorney. Uh, regarding the double patenting, uh, which you point out very well, I think uh, that the, the best way is uh, uh, to, to do when entering in the European phase to enter in the national phase of a PCT application. And, but this uh, route is not allowed for all the countries. For instance, it's allowed for Germany, Italy, Austria, Netherlands, but <clears throat> not for France, for instance. So for, if you have a PCT application, the only way you have to think about uh, before that, uh, or, uh, or, or you have only this, uh, the country who Sign the national route uh, uh, for for PCT for the national stage, and Italy is one of these countries which changed uh, two years ago the the legislation and allowed uh, allowed the uh, the national route for PCT application. Thank you. Thank you for your input. Thank you. Last, if no last question, I yeah, one other question. I guess what we are first so we'll move uh, uh, to the fundamental distribution, and after this we'll have a lunch uh, in the Mandalay restaurant. It's at the first floor. So, but before moving downstairs, we need to have a group photo. Uh, let's just start with this fundamental uh, presentation. Yeah, one second. Everybody, uh, please come forward for the group photo so we can have uh, the photo over here.
the day which is IPR in DeFi, NFTs, Metaverse, and DAO. So I'll be moderating this session, and we have our speakers as Abhinav Banerjee. He's the lead IP analyst at Airbus India. Abhinav is an IP professional with over 10 years of experience across various in-house IP roles with focus on IP research and analytics. Having been part of and also in charge of different in-house IP teams, Avinav has handled multi-dimensional intellectual property related aspects that demand solutions in a corporate environment from technology profiling and road mapping to IP harvesting and generation, IP maintenance and auditing, IP enforcement and technology transfer and licensing. He specializes in topics related to industrial Internet of Things and Industry 4.0 Advanced Digital Manufacturing and MRO, Digital Twins and Digital Thread, Industrial Blockchain Implementation, 3D Printing, Smart Wireless, Sensor Networks, AI ML in Industrial Application and Smart Factory Solutions. Let's welcome Avinav. Our second panelist is Begum Erturk, Legal Manager, Legal and Compliance Department, Turkey. Begum Erturk is a lawyer registered in the Istanbul Bar Association since 2011 and a trademark attorney registered in the Turkish Patent and Trademark Office since 2013. With over 11 years of professional experience and solid national and international law background in particularly IP and IT law, blockchain, IoT, M2M, AI, etc., data protection and cybersecurity law, competition law, e-commerce law, corporate law, and M&A. Begum is experienced in providing services on strategy and public policies, working with the leading American, European, Canadian, and Asian companies, cooperating with the world's top legal firms, providing training courses, leading IP and IT and data privacy, Focus gap analysis, business modeling and design, full scope compliance projects for local and multinational companies performing in various sectors. So I invite, I'll start with Begum Arthur. Can I invite her to start with her presentation? Yeah. Okay, hello, hello again. I didn't expect to speak uh, first <laughs> at first uh, for this uh, panel. So uh, my topic, my next topic is about NFT regulations and copyrights. So I will be trying to um, explain all of these uh, regulations and um, try to uh, brainstorm with you about the um, copyright issue on, uh, in NFT sector. Uh, so, in this presentation, we will be all together actually seeking answers to many questions such as NFTs, are they regulated? What is NFT and how do they work? NFTs are, um, is the legal status of an NFT, what is the legal status? And we will also be uh, seeking solutions for many issues uh, about tax issue, trademark infringement, theft, copyright infringement and uh, money laundering. These are with many. Uh, these are all um, very hot topics uh, for NFT sector and also overall uh, blockchain sector. Uh, yes, actually, um, NFTs haven't been regulated yet in USA, in U in EU, in UK, and in Turkey yet. Uh, but there are lots of uh, draft laws. Uh, uh, um, lawmakers they they, they just uh, work on. Uh, but actually, however, uh, even though there is no uh, specific regulation for this, uh, for this issue, um, judges actually, uh, they make law uh, at the moment. And also authorities, they are trying to determine the status of um, NFTs uh, 
in order to um, just give a decision if the NFT is an asset, if the NFT covers our copyrights. Um, <clears throat> so uh, the judges and the authorities, uh, they are uh, now uh, taking the role of the um, rule makers. And I will just, uh, I'm just giving you some ideas about um, the case law in UK, China, US and Turkey. Uh, in all of these countries, actually, uh, even though there is no law, uh, no, no, no specific regulation, as I said before, uh, in these um, in these com countries, um, judges actually they they give uh, decisions um, by by considering NFTs as an asset, um, like in UK, for example, Lavinia Deborah Osborne um, case. Um, so it's uh, NFTs; they are they are considered as a property. Uh, and in China, actually, um, the platforms which sells um, NFTs, not which sells, but they, they, they are just intermediaries for, uh, for the companies which uh, sells uh, and trade NFTs. So in China, for example, um, the authority, the, the judge that just, um, the authority just mm, take, uh, made uh, platforms responsible uh, of the, um, uh, of the uh, contracts and uh, harm, harms uh, for the customers. Uh, so now in China, lots of uh, platforms, uh, intermediary platforms, they are uh, responsible of um, misbehaviors of their merchants which sells uh, uh, NFTs. So uh, in USA, actually, as you, you all know, in terms of uh, cryptocurrency and tokenizations, uh, there is um, SEC authority uh, so it's, um, it's just assessing uh, case by case NFTs if they are uh, whether they are uh, it can be they can be considered as a security tokens. If they are considered as a sec security tokens, uh, so they just ban uh, this uh, this trade and this business model, and they they just don't uh, allow uh, the NFTs uh, selling in this way and designing in this way. And in Turkey, uh, actually, we have uh, we have a recent case. Uh, so uh, even in Turkey, judges ju they just uh, consider NFT in somehow. Uh, of course, they also consider case by case, but they consider NFTs as is an asset. So it's very important because um, uh, when you have problems between customers and sellers and between customers and platforms. If NFT is considered an, as an asset, you can just um, uh, stop uh, to stop the transfer of the NFTs uh, from uh, from a seller to another. Uh, and actually, in European Union, um, there is um, actually draft law uh, which is called uh, Markets in Crypto Assets Regulations. Uh, regulations is actually applicable um, for all European Union member states. Uh, so it's a very obligate, uh, mandatory uh, regulation. It will be a very mandatory regulation, and member states must really um, uh, apply and implement this regulation as it is. It is the, this is the difference between regulation and um, uh, and the other uh, EU uh, supervisor authorities' um, uh, legislations. Uh, so these regulations will be enter into force um, maybe within mon one month. Uh, but actually, uh, even even though this regulation actually is the first regulation, first comprehensive regulation directly addressing crypto assets, um, with the aim of boosting innovation while preserving financial stability and market integrity and protecting investors from risk. Uh, actually, this regulation doesn't specifically uh, cover um, NFT issues, but if the NFTs, uh, non-fungible tokens, uh, they are considered as cryptocurrencies in some way, uh, so um, this can uh, fall uh, into this uh, regulation and um, the issues can be solved uh, under these regulations. So uh, let's talk about um, the definition of NFTs. What is NFTs? Uh, I all just uh, Pronounce it uh, just NFT, NFT. What is this? This is one, one non fungible token. Uh, this uh, non fungible token, um, because actually uh, crypto assets, uh, it is divided into two. Uh, crypto assets, they are one, uh, one group uh, covers fungible tokens, 
Uh, these are cryptocurrencies, and the other group covers non-fungible tokens. Uh, fungible tokens can be traded in each other, like um, like currencies, like dollars, dollars to euro. You know, uh, as you as you all know, Bitcoin, Ethereum, uh, cryptocurrency, and other altcoins. But actually, uh, non-fungible tokens cannot be traded each other. So you can, for example, buy these uh, NFTs uh, by Bitcoin, or um, you can. Yeah, you can just uh, buy these NFTs uh, with uh, cryptocurrency, but uh, once you buy these NFTs, they cannot be traded each other because they are not fungible. So they are unique. Um, like, uh, for example, you cannot trade your car, you cannot exchange your car with another car. You need to value first uh, your car, and the other party must value its, uh, his or her car. So um, under um, between this valuation, uh, you can trade it. You can make a trade, but you cannot give your car, uh, for example, your Ferrari, and you can directly take your Porsche. So these are not um, unique things. These are not fungible uh, assets, actually. So 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 NFT ours. So uh, what does it mean again? The technically um, NFT non fungible tokens. Uh, the combination of elements contained into a uh, token actually and uh, make this uh, digital asset unique. As you see um, on the table, uh, there are lots of technical words going on. So there, um, if you see these kind of um, elements, you can just consider um, this um, token is an NFT. So you need to have one's uh, token ID, contract address, uh, so only one token in the world exists with with that uh, combination. So when you uh, when you buy an NFT, you have uh, you you cannot uh, find any other um, NFT under this uh, combination, under this contract address, token ID, etc. And other important elements you must find in, into uh, these NFTs. Actually, um, the wallet address you need to have a digital wallet. And also the link, uh, most NFTs also commonly include a link to where the original work can be found because um, the original work, uh, actually in the NFT world, there are two, uh, two models. You can, uh, for example, if, you, if we talk about digital assets, you can um, create this digital asset into blockchain uh, and it will be this, uh, this digital um, for example, painting will be only based, uh, blockchain based, but it's very, very uh, complicated and uh, very expensive way. So that's why you put your link into your um, NFT contract, smart contract, we call it smart contract. So you just uh, click on this link and this link uh, brings you to the uh, original uh, part of this asset, digital assets. So you can uh, go to directly to a website and you can see uh, your digital asset. So it is the different things. NFT is the, um, is the way of, uh, of obtaining your digital assets actually. NFT is not um, directly uh, a, a digital asset. So th these are the two different things. I will explain you later on more clear clearly. So uh, yeah, we we just actually uh, I don't actually talk about bit, uh, the difference between crypto assets and NFT. So I I'm skipping. Uh, so we I I talk uh, I told you that uh, tokens can represent anything. So crypto uh, assets actually can represent anything, but actually um, so that anything which can be digitized can be turned into an NFT. So um, all tokens cannot be NFT, but uh, NFTs can be uh, can can be considered as tokens. So the the big uh, subject is tokens. So NFT is sub uh, subgroup. So all uh, all things, all assets uh, which can be digitized can be an NFT. So if we give an example like uh, memes, music albums, Twitters, pictures, videos, and also law cases uh, nowadays. Uh, law cases, the petitions, and the brief of the cases, they can be transferred into NFT. Uh, this means, um, 
For example, there is a law case, international law case, and um, the, um, the plaintiff will, uh, is, is supposed to um, earn from this case, for example, 100 euro. And, uh, and it's, it's, this plaintiff, they transform its cases into NFT and then sell for, uh, to 100 person. And, it's, uh, and he values this case. And, and he turns uh, this case into NFT, and during the process, this NFT can, this NFT's value can increase or decrease. It, it will depend on the uh, case process. If he wins, the, the, the value of these NFTs uh, will be uh, increased at the top. If uh, he loses, of course, the value of the NFTs will be zero. So this kind of, um, actually, business model exists nowadays. So, uh, if we come to the copyrights uh, in NFTs, actually the copyright law in Turkey, I can, I can just tell that um, it is regulated under copyright law and uh, when we tell, uh, when, when we speak about copyright, actually we, we consider it as artwork. So um, when you see copyright words, you just uh, directly go and understand art. It, this, this means artwork. And artwork means any kind of intellectual and artistic product bearing the characteristics of its owner and which is considered a work of science and literature, music, fine arts, or cinema. So uh, I don't want to give you all the details of copyright law, but uh, the main and the main things you need to consider, uh, you need to take it um, into consideration, the formalities uh, from the NFT perspective, because um, if you wanna uh, buy an NFT, you need to uh, look at the contracts, smart contracts, because normally uh, licensing contracts they must be written, but um, if the licensing contract is not uh, is not written. You don't you don't get the license C rights uh, by buying this NFT. You just um, get the ownership of a part of the uh, of part of the digital assets or hold the digital asset. It depends on the contract. So you really need to go to this platforms um, contracts uh, policies. And also, you need to look at these smart contracts uh, if, it's, uh, if there are some more information about the ownership or licenses, licensee rights. So, um, NFT, there are actually uh, three types of NFTs, uh, as I told you before. Um, NFTs actually can be used as a registration way. NFT can be used as a digital certificate and a crypto asset. Uh, the third one I told it's very expensive, so uh, you cannot really see uh, NFTs as, a, as crypto assets. They, are, uh, general, they generally represent uh, registration and digital certificates. What does it mean? Uh, in, instead of um, going to the authority and register your copyright, you put your digital asset, your artwork, uh, into blockchain systems, and uh, you actually transform your digital uh, artwork into NFT, and you have your unique address. And this unique address uh, has a, this unique address, and your NFT actually has a timestamp, so you can prove your ownership that uh, you have created this artwork at this time, at this moment, and it is in the blockchain. And blockchain uh, system, uh, once you put it in the blockchain system, you cannot be uh, removed and nobody can uh, erase or remove or revise or change this um, digital asset. This is the main um, features of the blockchain. So digital certificate means that um, when you sell your um, artwork, you can prove that this uh, work belongs to you but not to, the to another party. party. If, the, if another third party just comes and claims, uh, you can just see, uh, you can just show him your registration certificate and the digital certificate that you give uh, during the uh, selling process. So uh, during, during um, the purchase, uh, as I told you, you need to, you need to uh, 
uh, pay attention uh, of the contracts that platforms uh, gives you. And uh, actually, there is also a confusion uh, between, uh, reality, between reality, because uh, some buyers actually think that they acquire the underlying work of art and all of its uh, accompanying rights. Uh, however, uh, they are generally simply buying the metadata associated with the work, but not the work itself. So um, that's why you need to look at this contract. If the seller, uh, he or she sells you the entire work or just a piece of work. So, um, so generally, you, you generally buy a, a piece of work. So that's just a digital number you have. And this is sometimes not considered as an asset, uh, neither an artwork and nothing, you just buy it. Uh, more to be clarified, actually there are lots of cases, but uh, maybe you can just go and search and uh, take more detail. Uh, I don't want to waste my time because it, it remains me uh, just, um, I, I have no time, yeah, I, I, over time. Uh, so there are lots of cases about NFTs and um, actually uh, we need to just uh, maybe think about how uh, the NFT platforms sh uh, should be regulated and um, obliging uh, marketplace service providers to apply uh, KYC, know your customer rules, uh, both for sellers and buyers of NFTs. Is it, is it a good way or not? Creating awareness, we, we should, uh, or regulators or lawmakers should create awareness actually on how to read a smart contract uh, and how to determine the types of NFT. Um, and also you can also take uh, legal advices uh, about uh, reading uh, smart contracts. And also IP law services on NFT marketplace for the sellers who need to understand if they, uh, their expectation and the smart contract condition meets. This is very important. Uh, so just uh, read all the, uh, all the details uh, of the platforms and the NFT uh, linked uh, smart contracts and you can uh, just avoid the, uh, the um, how can I say, the, 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 mis the infringement, you can also uh, avoid the fraud. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Begum, uh, for these valuable insights in the NFTs. Now I request uh, Abhinav Banerjee to come up on the stage and uh, share his valuable thoughts in the NFTs and metaverse. Oh, that. <laughs> All right. Yeah. Okay. Um, hello. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, I'm Avinav. I'm from the Airbus IP Analytics and Intelligence team based out of Bangalore, India. And uh, today, uh, I'm going to be talking about an important aspect of the metaverse, which is not really spoken about in the media as such, because this is the less glamorous part. But to be honest, this is going to affect all our lives in 10 years, 15 years down the line. How, you may ask, it will be in terms of the way you use something, the way it is built, the way you pay for it, and everything involved in it, OK? So uh, I'm just going to brush, on, brush up on what we're going to be talking about today. We're going to talk about something like what is an OEM metaverse. OEM, like we all know, original equipment manufacturer, right? So it's something like the organization I work for. We make aircraft. Uh, our friends at Boeing, they make aircraft. Then you have the automotive industry. They make cars, right? So basically, you know, when you manufacture a product, that's the OEM industry. Uh, then we're going to talk about what value does the metaverse bring to, the, to an OEM. We're going to talk about where IP is generated in the OEM metaverse and what the challenges are in managing that kind of IP. So first things first, the OEM metaverse is going to be a combination of the industrial metaverse and the consumer metaverse, right? Now, uh, consumer metaverse is what uh, most of you would have heard of, 
or read about. It's the consumer metaverse. Is the metaverse that Zuckerberg sells to all of you, all right? It's where you can have virtual parties and virtual meetings and events and this and that, right? The less spoken about is the industrial metaverse, which is metaverse where um, you know, uh, companies who manufacture things are going to be uh, using different digital tools and dig digital alignment ecosystems to come up with better products, safer products, and uh, basically uh, their in own internal efficiencies are dependent on that. So they can basically come up with better, safer, efficient, and cheaper products and services for all of you, right? Uh, now, the difference between the industrial metaverse and consumer metaverse is in the uh, consumer metaverse, you basically have virtual world scenarios and scenes, right? It may or may not mirror real world realities, all right? It may be more focused on enhanced on the uh, basically the user experience, you know, how you make something more immersive and uh, you use AR and VR and the likes to give you a new experience, all right? And it covers mostly the product users and services. So the consumer metaverse is where the services are going to be delivered to you, the, that aspect of the metaverse. However, the industrial metaverse is actually more challenging and difficult to build because it involves real world scenarios. It will simulate or mirror real world realities in real time. This is the thing. It has to be in real time or else it's of no use to us. It'll invo involve, it, it involves safety critical applications, all right? So we are talking about lives being in danger if something goes wrong. And it will cover the entire product life cycle, not just how you deliver the service or how your product is used. It involves everything from the way it is designed to the way it is manufactured to the way it is sold to the way it is, uh, let's talk about sustainability, you know, recycled and brought back into the manufacturing ecosystem. So this uh, particular slide just gives you an idea of wh what kind of value these two different metaverses bring in, right? You can see on the consumer metaverse, it's much more, uh, it's better understood, right? But for an OEM, um, the industrial and the consumer metaverse is equally important, all right? Now, if you talk about the consumer metaverse, the value that it gives for an OEM is it helps us with the, uh, so you have the, on the left hand side, the gr first green box that you see is where you have the OEM's own metaverse, right? The, uh, basically how you deliver product and services to the customer. So customer interaction, product experience, after sales support, uh, saving operational cost, your own and your customers. Environment and carbon emissions and, uh, you know, uh, carbon emission mitigation, sustainability, stuff like that. And, and then you have a separate part of the metaverse, which is the third party metaverse, if I may call it, right? That's where the OEM's products are going to be in um, third party metaverse. Think of it, uh, I'll give you a very simple example. Think of it like, um, uh, um, let's say, a Ferrari car in a particular video game, right? Now, uh, this is an asset, it's a Ferrari asset. It'll be a Ferrari digital twin. So it's not just going to be a car which is designed to look like that. It's going to perform that way, right? It'll have all the features that its physical twin has. That's the extent we are talking about. So how do you manage your presence in these third party platforms? You can have things like uh, uh, product service and discovery ads, your presence in virtual events. So, you know, uh, we don't need to sit here. These brand names could have been in a metaverse thing, and people from these companies could have been talking to you as you're listening. Now, uh, the other one is uh, brand image and sponsoring. So, you know, these OEMs can go out and sponsor events, right? And you have things like uh, also social engineering and alignment. It's very interesting, like if you um, uh, remember just a few years back, we have the BLM movement, the Black Lives Matter movement, right? And we saw a lot of companies who came out in social media in support of that, right? Now, you, in the metaverse, you can actually, so right now it takes someone, a brand to hire someone to actively 
take part, take a consensus on whether the brand is going to associate themselves with this particular social aspect and then take a decision on it, right? In the metaverse, things are going to be done differently, but then you can do it and it'll make it more immersive and your presence will be better felt in third party platforms. Coming back to the less, <laughs> you know, flashy part, which is the hard part, the blue part, the industrial metaverse. So I'm going to be talking about two concepts here in the next slide. It's called the digital twin and the digital thread. And the idea is to have a metaverse system which goes in through all these blue boxes, right? Right from specification, design, and engineering to how you procure material, uh, how you assess vendors, how you assemble, how you get certification for your products, how you maintain your products and offer services, and then, of course, you know, uh, the front end part sales and operations, optimization, and stuff like that. So what you see in front of you right now is something called as the industrial metaverse. Uh, many in the industry will, uh, if you ask anyone about industrial metaverse, they will tell you something to do with this. This is a very sanitized version of this, right? Um, there are different takes on what this can actually be. Uh, even for that matter, the concepts of digital thread and digital twin mean differently to different people, right? But uh, I'm just going to give you a brief overview of what they basically are without going into the details. Uh, so first things first, understand the concept of a digital tr thread, right? A digital thread is supposed to uh, give you the single truth, right? What we mean by a single truth is if I design a particular nut or a bolt, right? And it has a particular measurement in millimeters. It has happened in the industry where you know, in the next value chain where uh, it goes to manu being manufactured and your vendor is manufacturing it, what happens is the measurement, which was in millimeters, has been changed to inches and what you ordered and what you get are two totally different things. What does it do? It just stops production. And when you stop production, it costs you money. You fail on deliveries, right? I have given you a very simple example, but basically this is what it is, right? Now, what digital trade is supposed to do is, doesn't matter what it is, throughout a particular asset's lifetime, it will maintain that this is the measurement. Now, the measurement unit can keep on mutating throughout different chains, but whatever it is, the actual size, it remains the same. We're going to use a blockchain to power these systems, right? So that, you know, once something is recorded, it cannot be changed, right? It cannot be mutated. So now that we have established what a digital thread is supposed to do, uh, now the digital thread will run through, throughout the value chain, right? Right from design and engineering onto your assets operation, right? Now, what you see on the right-hand side is a picture, a beautiful picture of an aircraft engine. On the right-hand side, you have the real uh, aircraft engine. On the left-hand side, you have its digital twin, right? Here's the interesting thing. A digital twin, think of the digital twin as an avatar of the real world physical twin. So this digital virtual twin engine is supposed to behave throughout the life cycle of its physical twin as it is um, you know, installed in an aircraft and it's operating. It's supposed to behave exactly the way its uh, physical twin is doing. But ideally, this is not going to happen, right? Because in the physical twin, it's going to see a lot of operations which were not basically understood or not anticipated while it was actually designed, right? Now what's going to happen is using the data that the physical twin is uh, experiencing as well as it's producing in terms of its performance, this is going to be fed on to the digital twin model and the digital twin model is going to give you two types of insights. One, how is the physical twin running? Second, how is it going to run? So basically, if your engine is going down in another 5,000 hours, you can actually predict it, all right? You can predict it, and you, and you can, before a catastrophe happens, um, service it in the next you know, cycle. So you can basically schedule your maintenance cycle and save costs and probably lives. So this is what the digital twin is supposed to be doing, all right? So uh, this is basically what the industrial metaverse happens. Now, in the consumer metaverse, you have avatars in the digital, uh, I mean, in the industrial 
uh, this one, uh, metaverse, we're gonna have the digital twins. The industrial metaverse is going to be thousands and thousands of digital twins working together, all right? So, yeah, this might look a bit <laughs> thing, but basically what's happening is, you have the industrial twin. I have explained what the digital thread does, right? So the digital thread keeps collecting information throughout these different value chains. And using this, you can use insights. You have valuable insights uh, regarding the operation of the physical twin, right? So you use these insights to create value and generate new revenue streams, which was otherwise not being basically understood or being offered, or the company basically didn't understand that, hey, this can be a business. Now, uh, similarly using this, you can improve your own internal processes. Like if you have a vendor who's basically not supplying parts as he's supposed to, or he delays things, you can basically understand uh, his delays, and then you can basically take that and, uh, into consideration into your own manufacturing things and mitigate the problem. Now, what you see in these pink arrows are basically where IP can be generated in the industrial metaverse. Right? You have the first box on the right hand side top corner, which is IP in systems and process for different applications. So this is basically different applications you develop for the uh, digital thread. Similarly, you can have IP in integration to create the digital continuity. Then you have the, uh, uh, you, know, uh, uh, you know, you see the pink uh, arrow, the red arrow, I'm bad with colors. So there you have IP in these new solutions and services that you generate, which you thought you won't be um, ever uh, commercializing, all right? Then you have IP in solutions for solving the physical twins problem using the digital twin. Then you have IP in generating the digital twin themselves, all right? And then you have basically implementing these different new technologies, blockchain, AR, VR, cybersecurity, and you know, uh, software systems, architecture, data harmonization, ontology, and stuff like that. You use these uh, different technologies to realize the digital thread, so you're gonna come up with more IP in that also. So everything in these blue boxes around this main big box is where IP can be generated. Now here's the challenge. This will involve data ownership, data interdependence and data government, governance, right? Customer data, OEM data, supplier data, and your technology partner or your vendor's data. Metaverse models will need everything and use everything together. Now getting everyone on board and protecting their interests, how, we, how do we do that? This is in line with what she was speaking about and also I think we spoke about it a little in the morning session. And then uh, are the current IP regimes enough? to protect this, right? So also in the metaverse, a challenge would be IP protection using DRMs versus your content propagation in the metaverse versus monetization policies. These are three arrows going in three different directions and there's always a trade-off. How do you achieve a balance in this? And uh, I think I spoke about this in the morning Right, using uh, technology should be the first front in protecting your IP. It's good to have patents and copyrights and your IP rights, but then what happens is in case of infringement, there's a long process, legal uh, process that goes on, right? Now, if you use technology to stop the copying or track the copying or proving the copying in the first go, the moment it happens in real time, that's where real value comes in and that's where technology will play a big part. And also these new tools, I think we uh, discussed this in the morning also, these new tools will require regulatory compliance for successful implementation. Nobody wants to disclose the you know, software's priced functionality, implementational details. But with technology enabled and security assured regulatory requirements, we spoke about Aadhaar, right? Once the government is able to win the confidence of everyone and say we have developed a system which is fair, you're not going to get hampered by this please come trust, that's when people are going to hook on their systems onto the government regulatory systems, and that's where real value would get generated. So yeah, that's all I have to talk about, we can discuss about this. Thank you so much, Abhinav. Uh, that was a detailed insight on the industrial metaverse versus the consumer metaverse. I learned a lot of things in it. I've been trying to understand uh, metaverse for so long, but this really opened my eyes. And uh, you know, so I, I have one basic question. So, what, what 
all kinds of IPs can be created in Metaverse. So the patents or trademarks, how these things are created in uh, the Metaverse? You can actually have everything, right? Oh, okay. And even that won't be enough. <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> because um, traditional IP protection regime are, is going to give you a patent. Mm -hmm. It'll give you copyrights. It'll mm -hmm. give you design rights Design also. patents, yeah. But then uh, the trouble here is uh, for these metaverse systems to work, they need to get data from everywhere and work on that data. Now, the, here's the thing. Data proprietorship, data ownership is a big thing. Right. And then it's not about who, or where the data is generated. It's also about the government laws in that land and the mm -hmm. company's own policies, apart mm -hmm. from their ownership. Everyone needs to work together to have these things, I mean, work to their full potential. So we right. need to come up with probably new IP regimes on how to do this, because the current traditional forms are not really enough. Right, probably there are no laws yeah. to govern that, right? So I, I'm sure that uh, our audience would also have some interesting questions uh, in the metaverse and NFTs. So uh, in that corner, uh, Ramesh can take that one. What do you do? Uh, okay, so um, by trade secrets, uh, let us put it this way. Uh, when a company has its own industrial metaverse, right? Its own digital thread and its own digital twins running across the chain. This is a very closed system. All right? Now, this needs to be integrated with a vendor or a supplier's chain also, right? But then the whole pro thing is data abstraction. A uh, stakeholder sees only what he needs to see. For example, for an aircraft engine, the aircraft company, someone like Rolls-Royce or a GE, is going to have a digital twin. What they see may not be what an airframer like Airbus or Boeing sees, right? Also, what the end uh, uh, customer sees, for example, what Emirates sees, is going to be different. Also, uh, the service and maintenance companies, what they see is going to be different. So for the same digital twin, physical twin, and the different digital twins for it, they're all going to be different. Different stakeholders see different things based on what is agreeable amongst all the parties. Yeah, so um, here's the thing. I have discussed that these things are basically going to run throughout the life cycle of the product, right? From the moment it is designed to the moment it is simulated and tested, to the moment it makes its way onto the shop floor, to the moment uh, suppliers need to supply parts for it, to the moment these parts are validated and put onto the system, to the moment it is assembled onto the main product, to the moment the product is sold, to the moment the product is operating for 10 years, 15 years, 20 years, 35 years, whatever it is, to the moment the product is decommissioned. And when it's decommissioned, what happens to all, its, all the parts that go? Do you recycle them? Do you feed them back? Where do they go? Sustainability is also an issue. So how do you make those processes sustainable? And are you keeping track of whether those processes are sustainable? So a digital thread is going to collect data throughout the system. And as it feeds, the, here's the beautiful part. A digital twin gives you uh, downstream intelligence, right? Because now what's happening is, as I design the second generation of the product family, I know how the first generation is uh, I mean, uh, performing. That's the beautiful part of it. That's where the real value of a digital twin and a digital thread comes. Maybe as a lawyer, I can add something to, uh, to, this, uh, to, to your questions. Uh, and actually, um, we need to analyze this IP rights, how to protect our IP rights in metaverse. We need to look at uh, into three pillars, actually. Um, the IP rights of the uh, metaverse world creator, IP rights of the merchants who are uh, who participate uh, in this metaverse world, and also the IP rights uh, of the customers. And actually, uh, metaverse creators, uh, they have um, as, as he, he told that they are creating their own codes and everything, uh, and all codes, uh, please correct me if I am wrong, uh, technically, because these, are, these codes um, are written into blockchain, 
And um, first you write your code into blockchain, it is uh, blocked and uh, never erased. So you can also prove your ownership uh, by, by showing... By, 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 show, by showing your um, cause on uh, by showing your cause uh, which are inserted into blockchain so this is very uh, actually easily to prove your IP rights and protect also your IP rights and uh, for the actually merchants or other person participate into metaverse uh, it's also a little bit complicated because they need to be uh, pay attention if they infringe the other parties uh, other uh, third parties uh, IP rights because they put um, anything, all designs and everything into Metaverse. And sometimes uh, they put third parties trademark, like for example, we have checked uh, Metaverse words and we found out our trademark was in, in a Metaverse. But there are lots of Metaverse platforms. Uh, there are very well-known Metaverse platforms and there are not well-known Metaverse platforms, like, like in uh, cryptocurrency trading platforms, you know? Uh, so your trademarks can be found in metaverse platforms that you you never know, and uh, they are already infringed by third parties and abused, uh, as you are in this metaverse, and it can also bring the uh, very bad uh, reputation as well. So uh, this is a very very broad subject, and you need to analyze all the IP rights and also uh, in terms of the parties actually. I can give you an example uh, for this. Um, I can't take company names for obvious reasons, but there is a company who have come up with a, a, a blockchain powered system, which takes, uh, basically you have, you have to understand the concept of a side chain, all right? You have the main blockchain and then you have side chains, all right? Which form part of the blockchain also. So now think of these blockchains as being digital threads, right? So now you have one digital thread for uh, maintenance uh, activity done on an aircraft, okay? Now this is going to uh, involve history of each and every part installed in that aircraft, all right? Now they, they file one patent for this, they file a second patent for the side chain, which is a separate digital thread for each and every aircraft part. Basically how it works is the moment the aircraft uh, part is installed in an aircraft, that side chain is blocked from any kind of, you can't add a single block to it, it's locked, all right? And then only when it is uninstalled, can then that blocks be added to that chain again. What does that mean? The moment that part is locked onto an aircraft, no amount of modification can actually be done on that uh, part's history. You, nobody would be able to fudge any kind of thing, not the maintenance people, not the airlines, not the service people, not the manufacturer or anyone else. Even So what happens is, where's the value for this? insurance claims, and any other kind of things that you can think of. Even certification, airworthiness certification and stuff like this. That's very important there. Well, I, I have a question for when you were uh, speaking. Is that I understand how very well how trademarks can be valuable by the the metaverse, for example, uh, I've been working with that trademarks for games used in games, internet games that use the logo like Coca-Cola, like Ferrari, or um, clothes also that uh, the, the, the charter, the, the dolls, the cars in the, in the games are equal, are the same as we used in our days. So that's it's a very simple uh, example of the use of trademarks uh, in the metaverse. My problem is when you say that uh, the engine of the plane is like the twin of the, the, the real um, engine. But this is a question that I have for uh, many times, a long time. If 
we are giving the same the, the same the same share uh, the same if, if it is a twin a virtual twin and the we made the the engine taking in account the the thermodynamic method the physics a loss want the virtual I understand your question. So, ma'am, uh, first things first. Um, uh, when I say a digital twin in the industrial metaverse, it is something which has the physics models, it has the data-driven models, and all other kinds of models built into it based on what the application is. So, because understand this, these are going to be used in safety critical. Now, when I talk about in video games, a video game is okay. You have an animation of a car. It's supposed to sound in like that car, it's supposed to handle like that car. But the video game guys who make the video games don't actually know what, to that extent how thing that. What I meant is, you can have, for example, if you see the latest game, the Gran Turismo 7, all right? Uh, they are saying it is not a racing game, it's a simulation because what they claim is it's supposed to be as realistically possible as in the uh, real world. Now. And, Understand, uh, let's appreciate the fact that if we have these kind of insights, which, uh, at, uh, say, a car maker can actually license to a video game developer, that this is how, under these conditions, that's how car behaves. The extent to which it can be done is actually more realistic. In, yeah, yeah. created to to simulate uh, it's not not games to simulate and study the stress of the mm -hmm. engine yeah. and how it would have act to avoid to avoid avoid an accident mm -hmm. i'm talking about uh, a real or virtual <laughs> testing of the motor engine mm -hmm. that we would do virtually in the twin uh, engine instead mm -hmm. of the uh, real engine. Uh, so if you are using the same physics laws and we pass that physics laws to the twin, to the okay. twin uh, motor, okay. so um, it will be very difficult to see some stress situation that would oh, okay. uh, collapse the, the yeah, engine. Yeah, 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 yeah. I listen. So the, here's the thing: when I model a digital twin, right? Uh, it's not just CAD modeling. A digital twin is supposed to have the capabilities of all the finite element FEM tests, the CFD tests, the CAD data, of course, and then all the stress strains it's supposed to go through chemical changes also, all right? So it's supposed to have all these characteristics built into it. Now understand that in the physical twin, right? The physical twin is designed based on physics knowledge, the best possible physics knowledge available to the engineers, all right? Best available. A digital twin is that plus the operational data, 10 years of operational data of that physical twin. So now we are better positioned to predict. Yeah? yeah, yeah. And here's the thing. In the future, we are actually talking about, uh, if you're talking about autonomous systems, where the digital twin, based on its analytics, is able to control the physical twin. It's a very dangerous area to get into, but that, that's also possible. That's the most advanced level of digital twin that we're talking about. Yeah. Any other questions? All right, so, um, yes. so um, I have a question uh, related to the NFT infringements. So uh, in, in copyright, there is something called uh, fair use. So how these fair use things work in the NFT infringement? Any idea on that? So how, uh, your, your question is about um, how 
the fair use is so uh, you know in, in copyright there's like something um, something like fair use where you can copy um, you know you know the written materials to a certain extent so for example if you are delivering a news or something you can actually you know copy a, a part of a movie or something and show in your news so you still have those fair use things right you can use uh, those pieces of artwork or the movies or something to you know give a comment or a review or something so does that thing work in the nft uh, as well yeah actually you can you can apply you can implement the same rules to this nft words because as i told you before uh, nft um, doesn't mean digital work but the uh, the registration and the certificates of the digital works. So if you, uh, if, un if under the law, uh, the fair use is determined and uh, within the framework of the law, you can uh, also turn a digital um, art, a digital artwork into NFTs. Like you said, uh, a part of the movie uh, can be turned into NFT uh, by, um, uh, by a newspaper, uh, agency, uh, but but under the uh, press law, for example. Mm -hmm. uh, so the press law uh, can also just allow um, to use uh, fairly, fair, fairly, but actually uh, when you turn this artwork into NFT, it means that um, you, you are searching, you are seeking uh, to take advantage of this NFT, so you, you are seeking to uh, gain money uh, through through this. So uh, even the newspaper's agency cannot do this because uh, they just uh, put this video, part of the video or part of the news or part of the uh, dig digital work on the, into the newspaper or so something else just to, uh, just because to inform public. Uh, so you cannot gain money uh, throughout a person's artwork. Uh, even in the NFTs, so you need to be licensed for for this. Um, if you have a license, uh, if you have a permission from the author, just to turn uh, this digital artwork into NFT and sell and gain money to that it, uh, it means that in your license agreement, maybe it is written that half of your gain will be um, shared with me. The author can be say that, and the author and the NFT creator can work all together. So uh, yeah, so I, I have a similar question for the metaverse as well. So um, there is uh, there are patents and trademarks. Uh, you know, all these things are being used in the metaverse. So um, how does the infringement works in the metaverse? So has there been any case uh, like you know a litigation in the metaverse? which is into the patents or maybe the uh, trademark specifically? Uh, right now, the patenting system is not very tightly coupled to the metaverse ecosystem. Mm -hmm. uh, because if there is uh, something that I've created and it's floating in the metaverse, now if there is an infringement in terms of copyright or patents or whatever it is, I need to now, right now, as of now, it's the traditional process. Mm -hmm. Because uh, this two ways we can do this, right? One is the legal instrument, which is the patents and the copyrights and whatever it is. Mm -hmm. uh, the second part is Im implementing digital tools to keep track of these things in real time. It is basically, mm -hmm. it's everything that she has just said. It's you, It forms part of the metadata of the real asset. Let's call it the asset or the avatar or whatever it is, right? Now this is going to be powered through blockchain and smart contracts and what you whatever right now this is going to keep tracking all the different uses all the different mutations that it's going to happen now and let's just appreciate the fact that once i have created a digital asset and i let it float in the metaverse it can be used in n different ways all right okay. now um, i can leave it open for everyone to use but if i want just credit i i I can actually build this onto the asset or the assets, uh, uh, the meta, uh, meta, meta data that uh, whoever uses it, that the credit should be due where it should be due. Or if I want some uh, financial considerations in that, that can also be built in. But then we do not have concrete systems of that right now. Mm -hmm. 
right? right? So right. that's what I meant by technology should be at the forefront of protecting IP instead of having just legal documents to sue people or follow things up later. Right, looks interesting. So I'm just wondering, what are your specific inputs for the laws, like maybe for uh, the we have, patents uh, in metaverse? Yeah, yeah, I mean, we today we have this web crawler which kind of crawls around the internet looking for copyright infringements. It's there, right? right. right? Though it's very um, at its early stages, but it detects and then it raises requests for de-indexing those web pages. Right. right? Yeah. Now, uh, think of it this way. If tomorrow someone comes up with something which understands uh, the claims of a patent mm -hmm. for what they are. Maybe chat GPT now. Yeah. <laughs> and then it looks for if a, a, a digital asset or a digital system around in the internet, maybe an application, mm -hmm. and then tries to map the, A, we don't know the backend functionality, right? So mm -hmm. what we need is, it'll basically analyze the features. Now once the features are mapped onto what the claims or are relevant to the claims, it forms a prima facie case, right? Mm -hmm. Next is what uh, I spoke about, is we need regulatory compliance and cooperation, mm -hmm. where there has to be a port where organizations should and must uh, allow the government to use this kind of a tool to evaluate what they're doing at the back end, whether, 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 mm -hmm. whether it's lining or whether it's infringing something. Right. That's very difficult. But yeah, <laughs> to convince the government yeah. for yeah. the rules you yeah, want, yeah. it's always difficult. And I give an other example. If that can be done, probably, you know, other things can be done. Right. Yeah. All right, so one last chance for the audience to have the question. Yes, please. Uh, Thank you for your presentation, which was uh, quite uh, interesting and uh, new, at least for me. Uh, I, ha I have two questions, not one. Uh, one is a follow-up on the question on trade secrets. Uh, so being a French lawyer, meaning a European lawyer, uh, we have a trade secret directive where, and trade secret law in each EU country, which uh, includes the fact that as a owner of trade secret, you should be able to show the court that you did whatever was necessary to protect your trade secrets. So uh, how do you do, do you have uh, uh, something included in, in your S agreement S with your supplier, uh, power, oh. uh, stakeholders, whatever you call them? Uh, okay, I can't answer the, the, the second question, whether I, you know, about my organization having some arrangement, but uh, what I can say is, in general, today, uh, in the industrial metaverse, the application of blockchains and digital threads makes it way more easier to record something that you have done. And here's the beautiful part of it. Once it goes onto a black blockchain, it cannot be modified and tampered with. So you have an easier time proving to the court that this is what was done. Okay. Yeah. It, and it's a matter of the courts being able to understand and you know appreciate the blockchain. So there needs to be regulatory uh, modification in those, I guess. Okay. And my second question is a little bit different. So if I understood correctly, uh, each stakeholder has a different view or access to different parts of the digital twin, as you uh, name it. Um, so uh, now and. If I also understood correctly, you can track everything concerning uh, finally from the production of spare part of a plane until uh, the use of the plane and the maintenance. Now, uh, let's take the uh, sad story of a plane crash. Uh, and all those information are in the metaverse. Lots of people have access to different kinds of information. So. Uh, and uh, we are in the physical world. Everybody here in that room knows that uh, we are bound by laws which uh, have territorial limits. And uh, the metaverse has no physical or territorial limits. So uh, how, according to you, uh, would it be possible for the uh, authorities of the country um, of the flag of the plane to have access to this, this information in the metaverse, which would be very useful to find out why the plane crashed. 
So, uh, like I said, uh, digital twin can mean different things for different people. But essentially, the data it works on is real-time data that the physical twin is experiencing and is producing. So now, um, what I mean by different digital twins is, think of it this way, a shop floor person or a procurement person, he can actually see just like a smart sheet in front of him. That's his digital twin. But a maintenance person using his AR or VR goggles is actually seeing the real animated model of an engine. And then he presses play, it runs through 5,000 more hours of what can happen, what is its health, and then goes for airworthy certification, right? Uh, the, so, so, so that's the maintenance person. Then the aircraft um, uh, operator, an airline, this com they would see like, okay, when is the nest service scheduled? Is everything okay? What is the in, so their digital twin is actually be going to be taking inputs from other digital twin of the other people also. So this is what I meant by different people seeing different digital twins. And here's the thing, uh, the aircraft manufacturer's digital twin, most of it would be proprietary. They will only let the air framer or the air, uh, airline see what they want. All right, because they have to protect what's theirs, right? They cannot teach everyone how to make an aircraft engine. That makes them irrelevant. <laughs> Similarly, an airframer will use whatever is important for them. They will show whatever is important for the customer, but they will not teach the customer how to assemble <laughs> an aircraft, right? So that's how it is. So, and in terms of information, yes. If there is information which needs to be disclosed, there is regulatory requirement for doing that. You can just look into your systems and produce the exact information which is required to be produced. If there's a root cause analysis which needs to be done, it's easier to do it in this ecosystem today instead of playing the blame game. All right. Um, oh, okay. One last one. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Yes. Yes. No, no, here's the thing, right? This is the beautiful part and also the most confusing part. Who sees what? The data. Who owns the data? Who operates on the data? So aircraft manufacturers will see what is relevant for their business, but they won't know how the engine is manufactured. They won't have access to the models that go into building the aircraft engine. They'll have access to probably uh, how you assemble it, all right? How you operate it, how you run diagnostics and prognostics on it, how you can schedule uh, uh, service sh uh, services, right? Uh, what is required for airworthy certification, what is required for uh, say an FAA or EASA certification. So they might have th that kind of uh, information, but they would not actually have the real information that the aircraft manufacturer has used to make the engine. Similarly, uh, the airline is not going to have what the aircraft manufacturer is doing. They will only see what we want them to see. So that's how it's going to be the whole ecosystem. It's the same data, the same operational data or whatever, but different people see different things based on their context. All right, great. Thank you so much, uh, Avinav and uh, Vegam Arthur, for these valuable insights. And now we'll uh, present the memento for your contribution to the IAPLA. All right, uh, thank you so much everyone for this uh, participation and uh, uh, for this we end our day today and we'll be starting tomorrow at 9.30 a.m. sharp. We can now go for the networking of the coffee break and we'll meet tomorrow at 9.30 a.m. Thank you.